Hi everybody, I'm so thrilled to be here and I'm even more thrilled that you are all here. Uh, my name is Katri Lassila and I'm the president of the Finnish Darkroom Association, which is presently organizing the first Helsinki Darkroom Festival. And um, we are going to have two, not one, but two wonderful panels during this evening. Uh, first, we are going to have the Analog Festivals panel, uh, where in which are presenting um, four different analog festivals. Um, analog Now, Experimental Photo Festival, Revelate and Rot Rotlicht Festival. And then we have a small break and of course uh, also some time for questions and answers to everybody who are interested in uh, asking something from the festival organizers and um, after the small break then we have all things analog panel in which are discussing um, representatives from analog forever magazine and cyan darkroom and calamari club and street level photo works so we are going to have quite a wonderful peek to what's happening at the moment in analog photography throughout the world, basically. So I couldn't be more delighted that this was possible and you all wonderful panelists agreed to take part in this and came along, even though some of you have, have, are participating in these ungodly hours of 5 a.m. or something like that. But, uh, but so nice that you are all here. So to tell a little bit about our organization first. Um, the Finnish Darkroom Association, which I represent, is, um, is an association of analog photography uh, in Finland, and it was um, founded in 2016. We were six photographic artists, uh, six women, and we noticed that uh, there are no good spacey uh, work, like safe working uh, environments, kind of in dark rooms where, where we could work safely and make, make our art in Helsinki at all. So Natalia Kopkina, who is um, our association's director, um, had the idea that we should build one. So <clears throat> then we applied funding for it and got it. And six of us uh, designed and made, built the dark room in Helsinki. It's called Mörk. And there are eight enlargers, more or less, and then one big one and so on. Um, and uh, what we then did that we started organizing courses and we were a little bit worried if, if there would be anybody else than we six coming along, but, but it seems that we kind of hit the surge of the new analog photography wave. And now we have a bit less than um, 100 members at the moment. So it was really fast and a nice development in that. And then um, we started organizing courses and giving courses uh, and also younger generations came in uh, and, um, and we uh, noticed that there was this need of connection between the older generations who had been already doing analog photography in the old times and then the new generations who just had kind of uh, found the possibilities of analog photography. And the next step, of course, was to connect somehow also to the international scene, because we kind of assumed that, okay, this, what's happening in Finland at the moment, it must be also happening somewhere else, because we are not right in the center of Europe, but somewhat <laughs> in the border. <laughs> so then we kind of um, decided that we have to kind of start digging out a little bit what else is going on. And um, at first we had in mind this kind of web of photographic associations we'd like to uh, make happen somehow. And in this uh, order, we 
thought that maybe festival would be a good idea to try to connect everybody. And then, of course, when we uh, started to organize this festival, we found out quite soon that there are actually quite many already photography and photography festivals around Europe and also other organizations working working towards more beautiful analog photography world at the moment. So now Helsinki Darkroom Festival is right now happening in Helsinki. Uh, it was launched, uh, it, it started in on 27th or 28th actually, 28th of January and it will continue until mid-May basically. And um, it will consist of um, the main exhibition at the Finnish Museum of Photography. And then there are several smaller exhibitions, uh, then these kind of discussion events, at least this one. Let's see if any other we are able to also organize. Then there are workshops and um, uh, photo competition for young people to, to inspire them also in the analog photography. And, um, and then there will be artistic research symposium organized together with Aalto University in, on which I'm kind of, I'm of kind of in charge of on that also. So we've had so many uh, participants already from all around the world, from USA, San Francisco, Ireland, Oregon, um, from Helsinki also, Laguna Beach, London, wonderful, welcome all. And welcome of all of our panelists. Um, uh, without further ado, let's start with our first panel, which is the Analog Festivals panel. And to start, um, to begin, I'd love you all to present yourselves from all the four festivals. Tell a little bit of the festival, but not too long not right not just yet you'll get the time for that even more and um just just kind of present yourself who are you and uh, on with which festival you are uh, you are working on which festivals you represent at the moment so please maybe we could start with um uh, thomas from analog now would you like to present yourself yeah hello everyone thank you Kautri for uh for inviting me um i'm here for analog now berlin and uh, me personally i have an art history background i study art history in the masters so i'm mostly in charge of the concept texts and all this let's say text-based backgrounds and to talk about analog now um Analog Now was formed or was, let's say, was started in 2013, 2014, in a time when people, when our founders felt like analog photography is fading and there's like no safety net to capture it. And um, that's why also the name Analog Now was a try to let's say, contemporarized photography, analog photography, and to give the community a hub, a hub in Berlin. And that's also where it came from. Our founders were photographers, creatives, and also editors. So it was, in the beginning, it was formed to be from the community for the community, and in this sense, also very localized in Berlin. Um, our first bigger event was in 2015, and our first big festival was in 2016. And since then, we came up with a rhythm of doing a festival every second year. And over time, we grew and we also got to know, got to know more people internationally in Europe and in the US to form a bigger alliance. And I think this is also something other people can probably join in and saying that in the 2010s, it was a bit like everyone is alone forming a group to, you know, blossom this analog photography. And then very rapidly, it started to connect and grow. And now with the pandemic, we 
we take a different turn or let's say now we feel like we don't have to save analog photography anymore like we don't have to it's 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 not like we have to give cpr to the analog photography but it's more like to safeguard and create a future for photography that is like that has a place for us with it and this is i think our mission that we come from the community background but now we're focusing more on exhibition and curating and we had the four pillars that we came up with as like educate exhibit community and let me say what was the last thing like i had the artist exchange so we have like tried to have an all-rounded package here in berlin and that's also why we do it every second year sounds absolutely wonderful sounds really great thank you so much thomas and really good also i got very good idea of analog now for that yeah so then we have also uh representatives from experimental photo festival we have here Laura Ligari and Pablo, how do you pronounce it? Pablo, is it <laughs> or Jory or? Jory. Jory, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm from Argentina, but it's some kind of Italian accent yeah, or something. Yeah, that's uh, what I was <laughs> thinking. So would you please tell me a little bit about Experimental Photo Festival? Yes, thank you so much, Katri, and everyone for the invitation, all the festivals here and also the participants. I'm Pablo from the Experimental Photo Festival. We have created with Laura, we are the co-directors of the festival, this association uh, four years ago. Um, this year on summer, between 20 and 24th July, we are going to have the third um, Experimental Photo Festival. We call them easily, but it's the International Festival on Experimental Photography. For us, the format is a summer camp. What we want is to have uh, between 400 and 500 people in Barcelona for a summer camp where everyone can really share and be together uh, like the five days. That's what we are asking for the artists and for the participants because we really believe that we don't need to go to something close to a museum. We have big, amazing museums all over the world, but we really need to go to find, to create a meeting point for all this community. We are working the whole year uh, through internet and summer is the time to go back to Barcelona to our home just to share and learn with everyone. Um, that's why we have been working a lot to create uh, a festival mainly based on workshops and conferences because we believe that's a that's are the places where people really get in touch and get connected have the opportunity to share more closely. Um, we have been working also hard and it's really nice that you everyone is here uh, with two uh, philosophical bases. The first one is gender equality. We have been working for that uh, from the beginning. Um, we are having every year we have 60% of women artists selected every year and we believe that with example we can show that the things can go differently. And on the other aspect, we are working hard also with economical transparency. We really need to explain to everyone, not just our public, where our money is coming and going. That's the way that people is really going to understand that we really need this money to keep growing. And uh, if people do understand what is happening with the money, no one is going to have any questions about, about if someone is making rich or things like that with, with their money. That's something really good. And we invite everyone just to make an effort to go through these two concepts, at least just to have a discussion. And uh, this is a great place for us uh, to share our values, our ideas, and also to invite everyone to come to the festival. And also we are really happy if we can make anything together. Um, we are open obviously for proposals and we hope this can get bigger and we can have more like a, like a better connections between all the festivals because we think we have a lot of, of, of teach and learn from other festivals all over the world. Wonderful. Thank you, Pablo. So interesting to hear. So wonderful to hear how you are all kind of on the same path, but from a little bit different, like everybody giving something, something extra for the, for the analog community. It's so inspiring. Um, so then uh, next, uh, I would have here in my list, uh, Revelate and Juan Luis Ronco, if I pronounce correctly. Yeah. Hi, Juan. It was perfectly pronounced. <laughs> Thank you very much. Like it's difficult to, to find. <laughs> sure, yeah. 
Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks everyone for being here. I counted about 75 people, which is actually so amazing. So thanks a lot for the opportunity and for the invitation. Uh, I'm representing Revelat Festival here in, uh, in Barcelona, in Vila Sadedal, to be exactly. Uh, it's a festival that was born in 2010. Uh, was that moment when uh, analog photography was in risk, uh, when everyone was afraid because it was going to disappear and everything. So it was a kind of different associations that they start making workshops and tiny exhibitions. And the things that start to grow and grow and grow, people were interested, people were just so excited about doing that. So we make a second edition, a third edition, a fourth edition. And now we are doing our 10th anniversary in September. It's our 10th festival here in Barcelona. We have over 55 exhibitions. We have workshops with people from all around, the, all around the world, artists from all around the world. We are fighting to have as many people as we can, as much as diversity as we can, and try to give to the audience, to people to come to the festival, all the richness that we have in the analog photography all around the world. So actually, you say two minutes, so I prepared just this <laughs> to present our festival. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Juan. Sounds really, it's kind of, it seems that you have, you have grown really well, like, like yeah, we, yeah, we tried. Uh, yeah, 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 we tried. It was hard, eh? 10 years maintaining the same thing. Well, you, yeah. uh, you, you all know how difficult it is to you maintain something one year. Imagine 10 mm -hmm. things changes, yeah. some pandemic happens. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, for, well, as you can see in this group, the, the analog community is stronger than ever. So mm -hmm. it's easier now to have uh, festivals and have events and have communities like this. So that's something to enjoy right now. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Juan. Um, and then we have a Rotlicht festival from which we have Dino Reganovic and Kati Bruder. Bruder. And uh, they're at the moment actually in Helsinki. And uh, it's a little bit, I, I feel really sorry that I haven't been able to meet you yet but wonderful that you are here and let's try to meet tomorrow <laughs> before you leave it's been just a bit crazy with this festival organizing here at our end but it was wonderful you came here to visit visit helsinki darkroom festival so please would you like to tell us a little bit about rotlicht hi, hi. All together thank you very much also in our names uh, for the invitation it's really great to be uh, here and with all you two together, uh, at least on this cyber-based <laughs> platform now, uh, we couldn't actually uh, 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 not to come uh, uh, to Helsinki to see your exhibition where we went today to the Museum of uh, 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 Finnish Museum of Photography. It was it's really great. We can just recommending it and all the setup, all the beautiful artists, and uh, we are very thankful actually. Um, yeah, me and Kati are representing the Rotlicht Festival for analog photography. Uh, we are far away uh, from 10 years, <laughs> like our colleagues just before. Uh, we could realize last year the first uh, festival uh, uh, in Vienna, in Austria, and uh, with a great success, actually. Uh, it's also like kind of mix a mixture between exhibitions, uh, education, uh, uh, like uh, guided tours, uh, visits workshops. of studios, workshops. So it's taking ten days. Uh, it's going to be organized uh, this year at uh, November seventy to twenty six again. And um, yeah, maybe if you could introduce something, say something about you, Kathy. I am Kati Bruder, this means brother, and I am a professional photographer and my background is artistic, so I studied at the Academy of Fine Arts. And um, we started to organize the festival during the pandemic because our goal was, like you too, and it's re really wonderful to hear, um, that we wanted to connect people and we don't have an analog photography scene in Vienna and we are very sorry about that because we work together in a small dark room in a cellar and it's really amazing and um, Dino came up during the pandemic with the idea hey let's make a festival for photography 
and we were all sitting alone at home. It was the first winter, the first pandemic winter, and this is really what we want to do. We want to connect. We want to connect galleries with photographers, with emerging artists, with elderly people. Um, yeah, and this is what our festival is like. So you can visit uh, the gallery spaces, off spaces, um, private homes. We had one artist who opened the door of an old Viennese building and uh, sticked up an exhibition in her flat. So all the people could visit the flat and her husband was pouring wine <laughs> into classes. So it was really amazing. And we had um, uh, super galleries and um, yeah, concerts in the night. And it was really amazing to have this festival. And it was a big um, a fork. <laughs> success. Yeah, it was a big success. Mm. And we were very happy about that. Yeah, we started actually with uh, our association 2016. It's Association for Contemporary Photography. And uh, yeah, we are running also or cooperating since almost 10 years with the gallery Photon in Vienna. So we are both professionals in this uh, business. Uh, on one hand, we are doing artistical work. On the other hand, also in between curation, uh, gallery work, uh, um, commission photography. So there are like many different things and, and uh, aspects. And uh, yeah, we would love to put all of this together and to share, to, to, share, to exchange uh, to, to, to work uh, with all of you guys together. And that's uh, now somehow the first steps. Uh, we start a half year ago in Berlin and uh, that's just beautiful uh, to see that uh, everyone is very positive about and happy to, to get together and helping each other. And um, yeah, thank you for thank all you of this, Katze. For inviting <laughs> us. Of course, of course. Thank you. It seems that in this analog community, it, it really is a community, which I'm kind of, I feel this warmth towards this this whole kind of the idea that we all are kind of in some weird ways connected to do the same thing at the same moment around the world in different places but all connected somehow so it feels really really wonderful and this community feeling is really strong I mean, it's stronger for me within this analog community that is that than, for instance, in Finnish photography community in whole. So there is this some something, some shared understanding of the value and of the of the tradition and of the new experiments and and all the kind of interesting possibilities we have at hand, as long as we just uh, kind of well at first kind of keep it alive and then develop develop it towards something else and something some new and uh, interesting interesting direction so so i really feel this this and and i feel it even more when i, I hear you all talking about this because it's kind of interesting how how um, how shared these visions are at the moment in the community so i got you had wonderful uh, jenna was asking uh, some questions what would you like to basically talk about and we got really well uh, wonderful questions so i i've kind of you really let me easy here because <laughs> because you have so good questions here that i don't know if i have to invent anything else but um at first i'd like to hear uh, one of the uh, suggested questions was that how each festival basically is organized so the structure Mm, you, some of you already said, but the structure of the festival, the length of the festival, for instance, how often uh, it's organized, how many people are involved in the organizing um, committee, or how, how, how do you execute it? So we could kind of have this overall understanding of how uh, analog photography festivals can be organized, basically. So let's start with the 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 kind of the the basics so the the structure of the festival organization like how many people are in, involved basically how often it's it's organized and how um how long it's 
kind of the length of the festival basically and then maybe if you have also already information about how many people are coming in so what's the kind of the how big is the festival in that way um i could start with let's go a little bit different different order for instance laura and pablo experimental photo festival would you like to comment on that first yes um uh, what was the question <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically the the basics the basics just to kind of to get the information about uh, the how many people are involved organizing your festival basically yes. how big is your organization and uh, uh, how often it's organized and uh, how long it is like is it 10 days or two months or so on great uh, for uh, our festival is a five days festival uh, organized every year in barcelona in july in the end 2024 is going to be this year and we have two different ways to of participating one is being a selected artist as uh, Steve marlon weston for example that is here he's going to be an artist uh, next year, the open call was closed. We have selected 48 artists from all over the world. And you can participate as a participant. You have to pay a fee for the entrance, 150 or 180 euros for having a workshop for free, uh, a portfolio review. We are going to show the images in our social networks. And also we are um, using the images of the participants. This is important for making the exhibitions. We are not bringing exhibition of famous people, but we are doing the exhibitions with the participants of the festival. That means that we are giving the opportunity to exhibit to a lot of people. I mean, last year we have more than 60 artists. Uh, 20 of them, they have never ever had the opportunity to exhibit. And that was a great opportunity for all of them. That's how the festival work. Uh, the the um, registration is open if anyone wants to get in. Talking regarding about our, our organization, we are uh, 14 people working in the different aspects of the festival. It's a really big organization. Obviously, not all of them are working the full year 24-7. Uh, we are three, four people working with the main aspects of the festival. Um, we are doing every week, every week, every month a meeting to debate all the aspects of the festival. And then we have like different teams that they are working with the different aspects uh, to have everything under control. We have a, a schedule, a really clear schedule every year because we have like different process and parts. And we are also having uh, a school of photography called Agora that is an online school. Um, we are having courses during six months every year. Next year we are going to be almost a whole year doing that. I mean, we have a big team because we really have a lot of, a lot of activities. Hmm, wonderful. Sounds great. Are the, the, all the 14 people who are working for at some point for the festival, are they paid for the work or, or are, are they like voluntary workers? They are mainly voluntary workers. Um, that's a problem, but that's a reality, at least on experimental photography. Uh, we don't really have like a big market. And that means that we don't have a lot of people buying our products. Uh, and we are uh, having a debate all, 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 all the time between the north of Europe or Europe that has a lot of money and Latin America that we are having like a step on each of them. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we can't really charge a lot for our products uh, because we really want to have everyone to be able to get in, even if you don't have money. And that's mm -hmm. why we have our prices really low with the school normally and also for the festival. And that makes hard for us to have money. At this situation, we have been working four years together. And we don't have, we don't really have uh, public foundings. We have been working hard for that, but at least in Spain, it's, it's really hard. If you have been working like 10 years, it's much easier, obviously, to have public foundings. But if you have started uh, with all this economical crisis and pandemic, and, and see, everything is really hard to have, uh, to find some public funding. We are working for that but it's, it's not so easy. I mean, the two directors, the people doing the, um, the graphic design and the web page and all of that are having money for this. And then all the participants, are, all the workers are having money for working in the festival, but it's like 300 euros or something like this. I mean, it's just 
the money that they are going to spend working with us that weekend, that week, and all the work that they are doing the whole year. Right. We hope right. this is going to change soon, but at least from right. now, that's the situation. Right. Yes. Yes. That's very often the situation. I guess that the money is, is always the issue and organizing things to begin with. Yes. Problem. And during these pandemic times in the cultural, cultural sector, sector, it's been, it's been really a problem, at least in Finland. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, how about, how about analog now and, and Thomas? How about your festival st structure, basically? How many people in the organization and how are you doing things and, and uh, so on? Yeah, our, our structure is that we are a registered nonprofit organization that allows us to have certain uh, tax reductions and some other benefits that comes with this, but also requires us to prove our nonprofit status every several years. And with this setup, we have around 30 to 40 members in the, in the association. And from, from those 30 to 40 people, there are around like, let's say 10 to 12 who are in the core team as active members organizing, or organizing our events. Mm. And I mentioned earlier that we do our festival every second year and also only for one weekend, which sounds very short or very less, but that's also because we do a lot of events during the two years, so let's say in this gap. And this is also um, how we set up our, let's say our structure. For example, in April, we're gonna do workshops in, in Leipzig at the Grassi Museum uh, Gassi Museum for Applied Arts. They have an exhibition for analog, photo analog contemporary photography up at the moment, and we will do some workshops with them. So this is also a way how to, let's say, finance, but also organize the events we do, that we are very localized and very, our network spans a lot in Berlin and Germany. And uh, we can, we can, we have to, for we have to fortunate we can rely on some public funding for our last two um, festivals, we got public funding from the um, municipal municipality here in Berlin, from Lichtenberg, that's the district, we do our festival, and that was a big help. Because otherwise, all the work we do is voluntary, purely voluntarily, and that means we enter this, everyone who's, who joins know, knows that they're gonna do it out of passion and for, for let's say, the sake of photography. And if we make some profit, of course, we, we, we also give this to our team. And in this sense, um, we are a bit, let's say, the helpers, the helpers on the festivals and the artists and the people who do workshops, they get paid, they get paid like as best as we can. There's also a fixed amount and everything very like upfront. And our organizing active members they are like in the, in the second tier. Only if there's something left over from artists, workshop, uh, teachers and help us everything, the leftovers will be going to uh, the active members. So that's the way we do it, saying like we come last and the people we work with and the people we invite, invite they come first. But of course, this is also something we can only do because we have other jobs or we do other things and we would actually love to have more time to organize analog now activities. And that would be something great to have in the future, to have more funding or other resources that we can increase our activities. And then we can also, let's say, professionalize our, our setup. And at the moment, people doing various jobs. I, I do some of the graphics for social media. I do some of the social media postings and I also try to do uh, the, the press work. But um, I think because our team is changing very fast from festival to festival, it's also every, every second year, it's like you have to renew your scope and how people work. And that's, let's say, the, yeah. the thing we go with. Yeah, that's how it goes very often. 
our, our, <clears throat> our organization is also kind of based on volunteer. I mean, everybody are working voluntarily in the organization and also for the for the festival. Or we have one one kind of paid person in our festival team, uh, yeah. communication specialist. <laughs> okay, okay interesting. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask like, who is the? Yeah, yeah. No, sometimes no, some one. people who have like a, who get paid and then. Um, most of the time, it's like uh, graphic or like mm, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The well, that's true. We have yeah. or something, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Graphic design also is paid for for the festival, but kind of the the other organizational things are are done by the members of the association or members of the board of the association, to be exact. Actually, but it's very interesting to hear. So when when is analog now happening? Uh, this um this year for instance at least i can say not this year because we had okay. our last analog now was last year in oh, right yes august so the next will be in 2023 right and at the moment we're also thinking what time suits the corona rhythm what time mm -hmm. suits the, the the open calls for public funding so we have to you know align the date a bit to our circumstances to mm -hmm. let's say find a date that works for our our like our our colleagues, or let's say the people we work with and the people we invite, but also for the audience. It would be it would be unfortunate if it's like in a very, let's say, high vacation season, you know, in, in Germany in the, in July, later June, there's like school, public school holidays and Berlin is like a desert. So <laughs> Um, it, it has to be some compromise. It can't be in the winter, for example, but right, right understandable yeah festivals would be nice in in the also in in helsinki in the summertime like there are lots of festivals in in the summertime but but for some reason well it was basically because of the museum of the photography and how their schedule was that our festival was in the middle of the like the coldest and snowiest winter for some time but um well we are going with that now <laughs> So how about um, we got experimental and we got analog? How about Revela, um, Revela T and Juan? Um, how about your? No. Well, I was yeah. checking. I was checking right now how to explain this because after ten years they get quite quite of complex. But there is something that always stays the same, and in there are some positions that, as you say, the board that remain always the same, uh, actually the same people from 10 years uh, to now, there's the coordination, the direction of the festival, the production, because uh, I think it's interesting, well, talking about people uh, uh, around the year, it's about 10 people, well, not 10, maybe seven people working the full year, and three months before the festival start, this this number multiplied by three or uh, by four, it's it's amazing. We have volunteers, we have, we have a volunteer program just for the, for the festival to be there just uh, on the, well, in the exhibitions or just moving with the people and all of that. But a part of that in the, in the organization of the festival, we have some volunteers, we have some people, it's, it's pretty amazing. I think up to 30 people will be working at the same time during the festival. But to understand a little bit how it works, uh, I didn't say it in the presentation because it was just a presentation. I can tell you now, this is interesting. Uh, the festival, Revelat Festival is made in the town and take place in different places all around the town, like for example, Rotlik. Uh, the main building is uh, an abandoned factory. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all in ruins, but we have the, the bottom floor uh, kind of modified to make exhibitions. So there is the, the main place. And then we have museums, we have some places where, where we do some stuff. So that requires people here and there and there and there. Uh, something that we have too is a marketplace. No, it's not a marketplace. It's a street market where where you can go and buy some vintage cameras. And we have few shops and we have two bars because if you don't have a bar in the festival, you are not a festival. That's a, that's a tip for all the festivals. <laughs> so <laughs> so that that uh, that is, is it's a lot of things to do. So a, a lot of things to organize. So we have a protocol responsible. A coordinator. We have a president. We have a production uh, that is gonna be is gonna take care of every artist because, as you know, in, in this in this group we have a lot of artists. I think everyone here is artist, and every artist is 
an own universe. So you need a person to take care of every artist, just like he wants to be or she wants to be traded. So we have some people exclusively to the, for the production and all the organization of all the exhibitions. Then we have people that is, uh, is, is going to be is going to take care of uh, social media and is going to speak with the press because uh well it became kind of huge so we have to go to the sometimes we, we were being in tv and that kind of stuff so you have to have someone with the communications we have a, a person uh, uh exclusively trying to get funds because <laughs> you need that person that is going to be knocking doors and asking for money is not the funniest part but we really now we really need it because yeah it's something that with this complexity you need uh, to get funds from everyone so in this case what we have is that a uh, uh, solid organization about six people it's going to be the president and then the people the coordinator the people of the and then we have we make teams for every task so if we have in for example we have in people we, we have to make this 55 exhibition we have to hang all the on the walls all at the same time which we, we're, we're going to look for 10 20 volunteers to make that happen if we are having for example uh, a complex installation with bar metal or whatever we need someone that he knows how to do that so we get that people and that's how it works our money comes from funding uh, from the government we have some yeah we have some help we cannot deny that because it's a long festival so we we were insisting all the time so we get the respect from the people and and we get some funding and something cool because i i, I guess this question from the people it was to interest to know how to how things could work better or less at the beginning uh, we pay uh, we, we charge nothing for the tickets so you can go to the festival you can enjoy all the exhibitions and you can do whatever you want all for free we get our funding we don't need money from the people uh, we can do it for free but after maybe two three editions i think it was after the third edition uh, there were a meeting and we say okay uh, if we want this, fest this, this festival to be um, for the people, like they own the festival, they should be part of the festival. They should maintain the festival. They should pay something just, just to, to feel like they, they own the festival. They own the festival, they're part of it. And if you give something from free, they're, they're not gonna get, they're not gonna get that sensation of ownership about the festival. So we start charging money. And I think it's about seven, 10 euros what you pay. But when you pay that 17 euros, you're involving the people on the festival. You are now part of the festival because you paid for it. And a little piece of the festival is going to be yours. So we start charging money for that. Uh, you can try to be like, well, we're going to try to get something, everything free. But at the end of the day, you want the people to feel part of it. And if you want someone to feel part of it, of course, you can be a volunteer. You can pay for the ticket. Mm -hmm. It's the same, but you're going to be in the team with us uh and we make workshops i think uh and that's something that i think all the festival here we are we are doing that we try to get the people so enthusiastic people with photography get in touch with uh professional people uh and workshops and that kind of things is a really good way to do it uh, we try to get the best people we can to make the workshop and we try to make the tightest prices we can so they can feel comfortable paying it it's, a, it's another way to get some funds and um, and that's it. I, th I think that's the main thing of course that's something that i think everybody has here as well we have some merch we have some stuff that you can just get that is a you know a drop by drop you can get some some cool stuff and you can yeah. have a souvenir so that's that's a thing oh uh, something i didn't say uh with this organization thing the, the our festival is one month long mm. okay this starts at the second week of september and it finishes in october and uh, during all the month, we have a main weekend with everything when, when everything happens, when we have the activities, we have the cinema production thing, we have all the stuff that is some workshops, activities on the street, this uh, camera market, all in the same main weekend. And now and then every weekend we, we make different things, so maybe in Canada, maybe activities, guided tours, all, the, all that kind of stuff. But mainly, I'm sorry if it was a kind of chaotic explanation, but it's it's kind of no worries, <laughs> no worries, Juan. Uh, I think we got the, got pretty well the idea. Oh, yeah, <laughs> thank it. you. Uh, very well. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So, uh, so it's one month long and and um, some small charge, and yeah. the, then the then the workshops they they charge something extra, right? 
yeah. so if people want to take part of the workshops so yeah. oh, the, the 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 festival is one month but when you get the ticket you yeah. have one week for the ticket okay right yeah it right. uh, was uh, all the month <laughs> you yeah. know so yeah. We, we yeah we, 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 we at the beginning we start well you get the ticket you can have the full month but it yeah. was like well we prefer you come you have one week 50 exhibitions seven days it's time enough to see all the exhibitions so we made the ticket you buy the ticket you have all week long to visit the exhibitions go to the things make the activities all, all that the, uh, another thing that's there's so many things. <laughs> Another thing that we have in the festival, we have the workshops, as I say, that you have to pay an extra. But then when you go to the festival, uh, we, have a, we have activities for free. Right. Uh, and those activities could be maybe anthotype, maybe uh, 35 millimeters developing with a tank or the street shooting or photo wall. And that's going to be for free. When we talk about uh, paying workshops, we talk about maybe wet play Claudion or the Gerotype or something that is kind of complex and only the material is going to cost a lot of money. So we have to charge for it, of course. Mm -hmm. But we have some activities that are for free. Right, right. Very good. Interesting. Nice. Thank you, Juan. Um, how about Kati and Dion, Dino from Rotlicht? How about your festival organization? And, and um... Yeah, you already yeah, told, just, told just something, kind but, of uh, happy that, that Juan came just before us because <laughs> in a moment we get uh, like uh, adults, uh, we want to be like reality. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, um, I see many, many common, common things like um, uh, 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 the, the, the festival, uh, like the activities uh, and uh, we are also like our festival, uh, it's happening at 35 different locations. It happened last year, so it's around 40 locations uh, every year uh, not just like uh, galleries it's also like off spaces uh, we would love to make some some off spaces visible there are so many beautiful associations and and artists working uh, in some basements uh, or uh, and then nobody knows about them so that's our our, our idea also to show to, to make these people visible um, about the structure uh, we are also like an ngo like i say we have like now around 25 uh, active members and all of the members are also invited to be part of the board of the festival at the moment uh, we have around 14 15 people uh, we have uh, every week uh, like a short fix meeting and uh, we try uh, to make it like in a more democratic way uh, without like some some up to down and and uh, so on um, yeah nevertheless we are we are mm. two uh, who are responsible for everything yeah let's say yeah. me and kati are like full year working for it and uh, there is also like uh, let's say a third or four people they are joining us during the year for graphic and uh, different uh, uh, different need but uh around like three months uh before the festival uh the the, the crew it's getting bigger and uh, we are also building like small sub teams they are organizing or taking care about different things um, um we all have our yeah. main jobs yeah, yeah so i mean main jobs this is actually for us for me this is the main job but uh, for me too like, it's uh, my passion how to survive how to pay my bills so let's say it's in in this way you know um what else what else money money it's actually not the problem because we don't have money so <laughs> <laughs> it's easy you know <laughs> yeah we started the last festival with yeah. a minus of four thousand euro and yeah, we didn't exactly. know if it's, it uh... could take place because we uh, we we, are, we have a pandemic we have corona and we didn't know one week yeah. before the festival is it, it possible yeah it was really a big risk a big and risk we and... we um offered a, a couple of of, of uh, workshops like wet plaid album in print and uh, carbon printing, carbon printing. printing. Or, like between 15 15 15 20 workshops we are offering this is still the only income let's say uh, our workshops and uh, also hopefully like our catalog and so on so last year we get recognized just uh, from the um, really uh um uh, a little see, funding uh, we got a like little regional, funding. regional uh, uh, city uh, government and uh, and then uh, the half of this funding can't actually just for the printing of this catalog it was very important yeah. for us you know to do it also bilingual to show all the 89 artistical works we could show during this 10 days um yeah the idea would be of course uh, to make it possible to pay people uh 
to, yeah, because, to also not yeah. to have three jobs to survive and then to work like uh, overnight uh, for the festival so mm -hmm. but we are very realistic we see this maybe coming in few years or uh, we hope now for the second edition the city is going to recognize us the city of vienna and can support support us a bit and uh, also because now we have like more time uh, to promote our workshops and so on so the, from this side so it would be like maybe the idea to get a third of the costs from selling, from workshops, from merchandise and so on, uh, a third from sponsoring and another one from uh, public money. So I think that would be like a health uh, construct. So we can survive and we are not dependent on, on just some public money. So in one moment, if they say, for example, they are not gonna support us next year, then we can turn the festival off. So we don't want this situation. The, yeah. team, the team, it's actually the biggest motivation for me personally for this uh, festival and for the Cut for Cut. Yeah, we have a great too. team. So we are just in love uh, uh, with each other. We try uh, like to get the best uh, out of our uh, work together. Uh, we have wonderful graphic designers. So we have uh, really a couple of people who are working. We have people like, like for example, Thomas Lichek, who was running uh, one of the uh, the biggest uh, festival for uh, more than 10 years in Austria, Eyes like on. Eyes On, and was also a member of the uh, European Month of Photography. But we are so also like very young guys uh, that never visit the festival at all, you know, and they're on, on board. So it's like a beautiful mix. Uh, it's hard at the beginning, so we are not able to pay professionals. But uh, we are growing together step by step, and, and this is, I think, the best what can happen yeah if not, we survive <laughs> not even the graphic designer and she's really very good <laughs> got paid for the last festival mm -hmm. and um we it was really a lot yeah. of work and we hope next year uh we're gonna put you like some little link of our uh, uh in the chat that's about a little video we just uh, uh published two days ago this is the kind of uh a uh, few for from last year so you could get an idea what's what's Rotlicht uh, about and uh, maybe we can yeah. share our desktop and no, no. it's okay. fine we can, <laughs> okay. we can maybe later if someone wants uh, the link is there and uh, also like um, we are in the first year uh, we could need support from you guys uh, if you go to this uh, little icon on Instagram and, and push the blue button you know and <laughs> follow our activities and so yeah, we are working very hard for the next edition. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be more international because we are inviting all of all of uh, our partner festivals uh, to the festival. Uh, we are open for recommendations for artists. And uh, on top, uh, actually, yeah, uh, we are not sure if we should say this, but uh, our open call it's now ready on the page. <laughs> so officially from the 15th of uh, February, but. Uh, Technically, everything is ready, so apply, and uh, I hope uh, we're going to exhibit your works too. Wonderful, wonderful. Please, please do apply, everyone. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful indeed. Um, wonderful news. Very interesting, very in interesting indeed. I, I recognize this problem that, that if the funding is not kind of if we don't know beforehand what kind of funding we are getting, it's really difficult to start organizing something in the first place. Maybe um, it's interesting for you too. Uh, we are here in Helsinki and we um, wrote to the embassy of Austria in Helsinki uh, mm. if they pay our, our flight and uh, and the hotel costs and they did thank and you very much is, on this thank you very much uh, for the invitation so there is also always a possibility if you go for it uh, somehow to, to manage it yeah That's right fine. to the embassy right yeah, yeah. That's really good and you, you get refunded the, the travel costs <laughs> right that's really good tip and i guess this these international cooperations are much for, uh, kind of sought uh, they uh, countries really like embassies want us to do international cooperations exactly. <laughs> so yeah that's, the job and that's true that's really because we want to welcome you all in vienna and uh if you get paid for that for the flight and for the hotel, easier, yeah. it's easier for you to travel and uh for us too of course to manage it then to invite mm -hmm. you <laughs> of course yeah that's a wonderful idea and a very good tip um thank you you know and kati 
Um, about our organization, I could say a couple of words of Helsinki Darkroom Festival uh, about the funding. Uh, uh, we got 50,000 euros funding from uh, Finnish Cultural Foundation and we applied more. We applied funding for also kind of putting this together, but we didn't get that. We got just funding for kind of covering the costs. So uh, for covering the costs part, we got 50,000, which was really nice, but, but then all the work was made kind of voluntarily within our organization and then we were able to pay the professionals like, like the uh, video graffer and photographer and and uh, graphic design and then then we were able to pay for our communications specialist who's been Jenna has been doing most of the communication and all the kind of the email communication and and uh, social media presence and all that basically um, and then with the, the funding we were able to pay the artists uh, or give them grants basically so that that they're the, we paid for the mailing of their works here in the main exhibition at the photography museum and photography museum also pays for the artists uh, a small kind of artist fee apart from that so um, and then we are able to pay for the as we are inviting um, professional uh, like professional artists to to uh, teach in our workshops during the festival then we are able to pay for them also compensate for the for the workshop teaching basically so that's kind of the organization and we were all the organization that's that was really good what you said um basically all of you said that that the, the amount of the people involved kind of grew closer the date came and that sounds really good and we should have done that also <laughs> because we didn't we were just us like the board of the association basically uh, and i think that now we are learning or we learned during this experience that we should have kind of invited more voluntary workers along to kind of help with the organization procedures and all that. So that's really good to know that you have been kind of already <laughs> doing this and we can kind of take take model of that. But as, as for us, we don't know yet, are we able to organize this again, this, this Helsinki Darkroom Festival and or if, if we are like uh, what frequency and how we are going to uh, fund it because uh, as an association, we don't have enough money to uh, fund it in this sense ourselves. But of course, if we change it somehow and, and the exhibit, ex we are not paying for the artists and uh, so on, so maybe so. But I somehow I would love to have this so that we could compensate also for the people involved kind of for their work but of course often that's not possible in the art scene so thank you for all your responses it was really interesting to hear for all um like all of you how you have been actually realizing these these wonderful events um have you have you met oh, any um now i yeah don't mute so um uh, what was the other question i got uh, which was uh, interesting was that um what or which have been the biggest obstacles when organizing these festivals what kind of problems you have met basically have it has it been the funding which has been always the problem or ha yeah, has there been some other have there been some some other problems also um i i'll start with rotlicht because you were the last <laughs> couple of times so so how about dino and kati have you had any have you met any problems or has it all gone kind of basically of course. it's a it's a couple of obstacles came up um starting with money communication um 
spaces, uh, artists, they are totally weird somet sometimes, yeah. We love them, but it's really difficult to deal with all the issues. Uh, there are many obstac obstacles, uh, mm -hmm. a road of ob obstacles, and uh, we climbed them and we fight it and we discussed and um, uh, yeah, that's my main job on this festival. Dino is telling something and I say, no, we can't do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, we make it this way. <laughs> and so we have different meanings and different options. And um, yeah, especially if you start something new and, uh, you know, there is at the beginning just a little idea. And, and then uh, uh, if you're coming closer to the date, then you know, you're working, let's say, at least a half year uh, uh, and you don't, you, you can't touch anything, you know, you're, you're producing something, but everything is just in your computer, in yeah. your mind, in even you know, the catalog, thousands of emails, whatever, you know, but from the first moment you're getting like to touch something, you know, and if it's a, the first flyer or whatever it is, you know, then you're realizing, okay, yeah, the first, real. the first it's couple of flyers we had, to, like we had to chalk, you know, moving, yeah. so there are like many, many different yeah yeah we, there are we many, get a... many different different things uh, at the beginning at least but this is not changing so i guess also with the years uh, you're gonna have always this uh, thing uh, what can i say the best is maybe just like to take it uh, easy and and to think uh, how to solve and not to, to, to stick on these problems and then that's what i yeah, what i don't exactly, like uh, if exactly I, if, I, if i see people they are losing energy just like about the problem and they're not yeah uh, for the solving solution you know and, uh, so every problem you can solve and everything you can you can you can make somehow happen you know so mm. this this is what, what i mean so of course the standard problems you have uh, everyone has probably you know you want to have something you want to, to realize something and for this you need in a way like uh, mostly like uh, if it's about uh, financial side or contacts or uh, what I had also like as a problem and uh, what I saw as a problem maybe that the rest of the board team didn't. Uh, uh, I was hoping from the first moment that of course like the, the bigger and uh, established places are going to, 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 to recognize us. And they did already in the first edition. And then it was like just uh, uh, the problem uh, wow what happened if we don't manage it to make it perfect you know then we are away <laughs> now, on one hand you're happy about this but on the other hand you're just thinking okay now the pressure is there no but everything went well already in the first year and and we are very happy yeah now, and we now are... it's different now it's like easier we have much more time and we're thankful for all the obstacles uh, we yeah. got because exactly. we make mistakes everybody's making exactly. mistakes so we had to chalk for example a, a box of invitations and a box of program because mm -hmm. we did a couple of wrong dates in in mm -hmm. this and we learned that we have to send it out before to every location and every gallery. So double every check double and check and yes, know, you didn't the have opening the time is for okay. the first in the first year. Everything, but everything was really on short term. term so, so it was not not even possible to do this. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like you know, uh, uh, I'm I'm telling always to the team, uh, we are very young as a team. We are very young as a festival, and we can make mistakes, and that's okay. You know. It's very stupid if you do the same mistakes like five years later, but uh, uh, if you learn out of it and if you go ahead, so you can you can make it possible, and and that's what we are doing. We yeah. are motivating each other always, you know, to stand up and to go and, and do the, it again. Yeah. And the first <laughs> week before the festival, we didn't sleep at all. We wake <laughs> up in the middle of the night. <gasps> yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Did I contact this person? And uh, yeah. maybe the pages of the catalog are wrong because we got some some weird pictures from from the printer, the print and we were yeah. not sure if it's working, if the catalog is all right. Yeah. And and then we got the catalog, and we were so uh, uh, released. Yeah, the, the catalog came actually to the opening. Yeah, to the opening of the festival on this like, day. A few days before, we got like uh, I don't know a lot of catalog just like to load up and to make. Yeah. It. I recognize yeah. this, uh, I mean, kind of waking up in the middle of the night in yeah. cold sweat, like, mm. what have I forgotten? <laughs> Getting like ideas, you know, then, then you start to have always some paper and some, some, some pencil next to your bed, you know, at least you can write it down yeah. and you yeah. can work tomorrow to, to yeah. fix this and, and whatever. Yeah. So, 
you, you said that you got recognized by these organizations or, or you got recognition basically, mm -hmm. but got you recognized by the press also, where you noted it. Less, that. yes. But we actually, got, actually yes. better, better than, than, than we thought about because we didn't have any one professional. Uh, that was like uh, the position I was really searching for it uh, weeks and months uh, and then we couldn't just find anyone who is doing this without money and understand it completely. So we had some kind of professions, uh, professionals who support us a bit and help us with the, with, with some, some little things, but uh, nobody was like really willing to, to do this job like completely for free. What is total okay, I understand. So that's why at the end of the day, everything what, uh, uh, I think this is like uh, the job from the management and then uh, from, from two of us, everything uh, uh, we can't uh, we can't organize by someone else or can sort out uh, at the end of the day we have to do it and mm -hmm. that's what happened with the public relations so we did it at the end and uh, I, I i told just okay it's going to be terrible but uh, the topic is interesting the name is cool uh, 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 like uh, um, analog photography it's getting more and more uh, fashion and and uh, uh, so that's why uh, we had like interviews. Uh, we had like some live uh, uh, interviews in the radio station, radio stations. Yeah, this uh, was nice. Some some magazines wrote about us. Uh, so it's like very cool what happened in the first year already, and uh, I'm very thankful for this. Yeah, this year okay. will be more professional in the PR way. <laughs> Great. Great. Sounds, sounds wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, if you are already um, speaking about this, uh, there is also a link on the page uh, to, 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 to join the newsletter. Right. Because yeah. we are getting out now with uh, a monthly newsletter informing yeah. about all the other festivals like you and this uh, event uh, too. So, uh, yeah. You can subscribe. Thank you. Um, how about then Experimental Photo Festival? Pavlo, what kind of what kind of um, problems did you encounter, or have you encountered any? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, 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 perfect. I just changed my to my mobile phone that is working better here with the internet. Right. Um, yes, obviously we have the main problem that is having money uh, from public funding mainly. We are uh, community based. And obviously we are having money from all our participants as, as we have that kind of funding, we are really happy and we are working for them. I mean, we are just sending service every month just to be sure that we are doing what they want. I mean, that's a nice way of having that money, but we know that to make it more professional, we really need uh, public funding. Uh, our situation is really particular because as we are in Barcelona, the situation is that there are so many big festivals and we really need to go against them. You know, there are no uh, small, like, foundings that you can just knock someone's door and say, okay, I need 10,000 euros just making this possible. You need to go, like, the formal way of asking for money. And if you have people doing festivals, not just festivals on, on photography, but festivals, music festivals, artistic festivals in general, it's really, really hard to have that kind of, of money, at least from us was mainly impossible and we have been trying that for the last three years. That obviously is a problem. And on the other hand, for us, it was really, really hard with this pandemic situation because as we are a community-based festival, uh, the biggest point of our festival is the experience of being together five days in Barcelona. Not being able to travel um, is making us really, really big problems because, as you said, we don't know if we have the money. Uh, because people don't know if they are going to be able to come. That's the situation. We need to have the money for buying the things. And at least this year, this is going to happen like last minute. For example, at this moment, we have, we want to have a budget or something like 30 thousand euros. Uh, that means that we have we need like 300 participants or so but at this point we have like the 15 percent of the participants already registered i mean we need next month or next two months to have like a, like a fast <laughs> people registering if not we don't have the money but it's really hard for people to make a decision you know at least for the way that we are working um, as we depend of the people coming to barcelona this pandemic situation and mainly the the closing borders mainly has been really hard for us. 
everyone that is able to come is really, really happy and the situation is like a miracle. But obviously this pandemic has go against <laughs> uh, being a social person and sharing, but that's why exactly what we think that is the best that we can give to the rest of the world, uh, this meeting point that is unique in the world. Um, I know that we are asking a lot for participants and for artists to make a big efforts to come, uh, but we know for sure that what they are going to receive in Barcelona is much more than what they have uh, even thought about it. For us, that are the two mainly problems. If we have public foundings, we don't have this problem with participants coming or don't, but we don't have this public founding because Barcelona is such a hard place for public foundings. And at least in Spain, a private founding is not working in any case. Uh, that are our problems. We hope to solve them uh, in the next couple of years. That's the thing. Um, just the last quick idea. When you are working with people for free, uh, people can work for you or with you or together for two years or three years or so, but in some point they want obviously to have money for what they are doing. We are trying to have this money before the original team goes. You know, we need to arrive to have the economic sustainability before that people leave because of not having the pain for the work. I mean, we are just running out to try to find that money before they leave. Thank, thank you, thank you, Pablo. There were <clears throat> in the chat, for instance, a couple of questions about <clears throat> would there be some EU money, uh, for instance, for festivals or could analog festivals work together? for instance, which would be wonderful. And uh, in the chat there have been several comments, as you may see yourself all, also how inspiring this is um, hearing from you all. And some EU networking support would be, would be maybe um, possible for us. That, that's maybe something we should all um, start uh, kind of looking into the next when we are now organizing this this uh, festival cooperation uh, network at the moment. Um, I'd love to hear uh, still Thomas's and, and um, Juan's opinions on any possible, thank you Pablo, um, any possible problems if you have encountered, but I have to ask you to keep them kind of I'd love to leave a little bit time also for questions from the audience. So if you can just, if you, Thomas, have you experienced any problems or what would you recognize as biggest problems in organizing the festival? Have there been? Yeah, let me first answer the question with the EU funding. Well, let's mm. address this a bit. As far as I know, we in Revelat already talked about this sometime and there's like some thoughts that is like circulating and I think one of the first things to do is to get in touch with, with, with each other and that's what we do today and that's also what has been started already some years ago and something that will increase in the next years but to really apply for the funding is a it's a big project like there, there comes a lot of responsibility and like a lot with it it's not it's definitely harder than doing the local funding but that's something we're aware of and something we're working on. And uh, by the way, good hint with the embassy thing for the flights and uh, commute. That's a that's a great hint. We I already noted this um, about the struggles we have. Yeah, I think um, because we do it every second year, you would think um, we have enough time to organize. But actually, because we have to finish the first, let's say, now we're still finishing up, wrapping up all the uh, bureaucracy and the tax stuff from last year. So it's like, we need a lot of time to finish up Analog Now 2021 and then start Analog Now 2023. And in this time, most, most of the time people change in the team because we are quite young. Like I think our median age is something like 30, 32 maybe. And um, so people change, people swap cities and jobs. And what we would need more is more people who stay for a longer time. And um, 
because every time a new person enters the team, we get new input, but we also have to find a new balance and we have to onboard them. So if you're in Berlin and you want to join Analog Now, that's your call. Like, come to us, text me or text us. We're always in need of people who want to join in like doing things and we want to join, we have, we want, we have people on boards, preferably long term, but also everything you can give. Like I told you already, we can't really pay much, or like can't really pay, but I think that's the biggest struggle we have to have a long lasting team to preserve the, yeah, the setup. I mean, Analog Now as a festival has been going on since 2015. We can look back on like almost seven years now, but in this time period, there has been so many changes in the team that the scope changed. And I mean, I think that's something like organic that happens with everything, but I would still say this is our biggest struggle that we would like to have a more stable team to set up the festivals. And mm. that's the call I can make. Mm -hmm. Really good point. <clears throat> really good point how to kind of keep this setup going on so that it, it can be somehow predictable. It would help in the organization, of course, quite a lot. Th thank you, Thomas. Um, now, Juan, still, do you have, you already told us some, something, but um, have you met any, any problems? When yeah, uh, well, yeah. Because, because I think we share the same struggles, everyone, and just to make a variety of struggles for everyone that is listening, so you can, we can have the full catalog of struggles. Uh, and I think everyone is going to agree about this, all the, all the festivals around here, all, 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 anyone in this group that is trying to have a, a project by itself, is uh, when you are not a kind of super huge, uh, you have to just make the things yourself. You can, you can count on someone or you can just hire a boy or you can just, but the amount of things that you're going to find out just when you have it in front of you and you're going to say, okay, so what is this? Uh, I, I have no idea that this was like something like wrapping a photograph that is coming from China. And you think, ah, oh, yeah, we have, a, yeah, we have someone from China. Just send the pictures. I say, no because I have to wrap it in a way and you have to send me back in the same wrap. So you have to open it. So you're going to have struggles every time, but they're, they're kind of challenging because there are things that are going to be new for you just once. Mm -hmm. The next time are going to be something that you already assimilate. So you, you can use more and more and more. And this growing and make these struggles a kind of knowledge that you're incoming all the time. But something when you try to do the things yourself or with a small team, is that everything is going to be new once and everything is going to be a pain in your butt once, but that uh, can be so exhausting. For, uh, but there are many things, uh, there are many things, just things with laws, just things with protocols that you, you don't expect, but why? But when you have the, when you have the thing that you have to think about it, you say, oh, oh, that's, that's cool. Something so easy that, for example, if you, if you hire an interiorist, uh, that is a professional in lighting. He's going to go with the lighting. We're going to put a bulb here and this is going to be awesome. You don't have to, but it's going to charge you. So, you, so you, 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 decide, you decide to do it yourself because, well, why not? It's just a bulb. It's a wall. What can go wrong? Everything can go wrong and everything is going to go wrong the first time. So this kind of, yeah, yeah. This, this kind of struggles yeah. is, is going to be something that you have to, you, you have to face every time because in your brain, it says, okay, we're going to put some music in this room. And in your brain, it's, it's just music. You just play and it's going to sound. And no, because they have some copyrights and this is for public, so you cannot play music. So there are going to be things that are going to be in front of you every time, every time, every time. And you're going to have to be in, in front of them. So if money is a trouble, uh, there are a thousand more travels, mini travels. That when, when they come all together, you're gonna <laughs> mini be, travels coming. Yeah, we, we can yeah. call mini travels. That's so, true. but you know, thank you. Did you have something? I'm I'm kind of wrapping up a little bit, so we got get some questions for from the audience. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only, yeah, only. But, uh, there that, were a good point. Just quick, kind of round 
with everybody not to end in this kind of trouble note. I mean, like end with a positive note, like one sentence, each of you, what's the best thing when organizing an analog photography festival? What's the best thing in that? Just in one sentence. Um, let's start with analog now. Thomas, what has been the best thing in organizing analog now? Um, whew. It's like overwhelming. I think uh, Dino said, until, until you touch the thing, it's, everything's virtual. Can't put it in one sentence, but the experience to do an own festival is a bit like being a parent, I guess. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. like the overall joy of having it realized basically yeah that yeah actually the thing is there like if you see the catalogs or something yeah. else like really no okay one sentence please the, the glowing eyes of the artists that we exhibit the the joy they have that was amazing wonderful Thoma. thank you how about rotlicht dino and kati what's the best thing the best thing is the encounter with the people, the mm. connection with them, and um, yeah, yeah, encounter. Wonderful. Thank for you. Me, for me, it would be like to connect people mm. because this is the task of a festival to bring people together. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. wonderful, really good. How about experimental photo festival, Pablo? What's the best? Yes, at least for us, the best is when you when people uh, make you know that they don't have this feeling that they are alone. Uh, mm -hmm. Because normally in experimentation, that's what is happening, that we have two people here, two people there, two people, and they have always the feeling that they are working like alone. When they come to the festival and they go back home and they make our survey, when they are saying that they are not feeling alone anymore, that's the best for us. That's wonderful. How about Juan from Revelate? What's the best thing? Well, uh, the best thing I, I would say, and having a group like you people here right now listening and so interesting and with the things in the chat, for me, the, the most satisfying thing is see that, that it's actually working. Because you start this with a purpose, and a purpose is uh, having this not dying and making this thing alive, making the analog photography panorama still alive and grow. And when after a few years you see that it's actually working, for me the, the, the most satisfying thing is to just sit, look at the people on the around you, look at the exhibition and say, well, man, it's working. We're, we're getting it. Wonderful. So this is for me the thing. It's the best. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful to hear thoughts and, and experience it from you all. Um, now we have some minutes for, uh, for questions. Uh, left uh, if there's anybody in the audience who'd like to ask something from one or, or all of the festivals now there would be time for that and your mix are open or you are able to open your mix yourself in the audience now so please now there's time when they all of the representatives of these wonderful festivals are here at the same time <laughs> If you have any questions, now it's time to ask. You can, don't hesitate at all. It's, it's very relaxed. You don't have to, have to stress at all. They would be glad to answer. Yeah, I was suspecting this, so I'm going to be the first making a Please. question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to know, uh, just uh, how to be, uh, how to have an exhibition in, in your in your festivals right now. If you want to have an exhibition maybe next year in the, in Analog Now or maybe this year in Rogli, or in the exhibition from the from the Helsinki Darum, what what should I do? What's the shortest way to have an exhibition on your festivals? Mm, please, uh, Thomas, would you ask? Uh, would you answer first? Mm. Um, we go with a very traditional open call concept and we will um, launch the open call already end of this year to, like we have to open it already this year for next uh, for the next uh, session and that's the way to do it we will broadcast it on social media and on our website and you should just join the open call and we'll have a theme again and uh, that's all, all I can say at the moment like in the last years 
but I can also like tease a bit because we will have an exhibition in Berlin in September or October. We're still working on it. Uh, can't really say more details because we are very fresh in it, but there will also be an open call. So that's something you can keep in mind. We will do something like late summer, early autumn this year. And for Analog Now 2023, there will be an open call from the traditional channels later this year. Mm. Thank you, Thomas. Wonderful. So please don't hesitate to apply. Wonderful. Uh, how about Rotlicht? Yeah, we have the same. We have an open call and we have a jury and um, feel free to supply. To apply, yeah, to exactly. Apply. And so we are now just about uh, to, to, to put uh, the international jury together. This is very thankful to have a, a external jury because we don't have this uh, this uh, hard decision to take uh, because it's really hard. Last year, for the first year, we got from 18 countries, uh, 98 uh, applications, and then the, I would love to show all of them. <laughs> so uh, this year we're gonna show even more than just five. Uh, it's gonna be around 20, we hope so much. So the chance it's pretty big. And uh, uh, we try our best really to, to, to promote those artists and to give them a stage. So that's why I have already an agreement, for example, the Grand Prix winner, uh, with the highest amount of points uh, is going uh, to be not just uh, exhibited at the Rotlich 23, it's going to be exhibited also, it's going to have like a solo exhibition in in, uh, 20, in 23 uh, in Ljubljana in Slovenia in the Photon Gallery. So uh, we would like uh, 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 to, 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 to bring it in the way that, that we are really promoting uh, those artists and uh, as a festival giving them um, uh, a stage and the possibility to, to show them to a broad audience. Right. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, how about Pablo? How How is your application process? Yes, we, we don't have a traditional application process for the exhibitions. Uh, what we do is we select uh, international curators with a conceptual proposal uh, they sell, they send us what they want to do. Um, we work with them to create new exhibitions every year for the festival, but and that exhibitions, collective exhibition, all of them are based on the material sent by the participants. That means that you have to come to the festival to be exhibiting. We don't buy or loan uh, ex exhibitions from famous people coming from all over the world. We are not doing that. What we do is to exhibit the people that is coming for them to have something to share with others. You know, that's a situation when you are an, an, in an, ex, an opening and you have 20 or 25 people exhibiting there, but they are all of them are there. At least for us, it makes no sense to show someone's famous work that they are not there to share with the people. You know, we have learned from the last three years that the, me, the best is to share. And the only way to share is to be there. Um, that's why we are working. If you register for the festival, you have to send us 10 images and that 10 images will, will go directly uh, to the curators of the exhibitions. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. Mm, for Helsinki Darkroom Festival, <clears throat> to answer you, Juan, uh, now we don't know if there's going to be another open call because we don't know yet if this is going to happen again <laughs> or if it will when exactly we have been talking about biennial like every second year like every other year not not every year type of festival but we haven't decided yet and it depends on, on the funding of course also quite a lot this time we had open call uh, which was through internet platform and and uh, the the <clears throat> kind of the open call was shared through different kind of we shared it through social media and and so on <clears throat> and it was answered 364 applications came or i mean from application from 364 different artists uh, and they suggested uh, their own their kind of series of work of which was selected uh, 10 artists to to this uh, 
exhibition at the Finnish Museum of Photography, it was the museum's wish that, that there wouldn't be more than 10 artists, then there was one invited artist plus the kind of extra. But the uh, museum had certain kind of um, hopes or wishes, uh, like how many artists they are able to host in the exhibition. So that's why it was quite a small number of artists in the end. Um, thank you. The, the, um, has there been another, another question? Uh, there was a question about the, um, the working together part, which was already answered, and EU money also was kind of discussed. It's kind of a big process, apparently, and, and there is at the moment coming up this festival network of festivals we are actually trying to put together at the moment. Of, of course, some of you already are in a network, but we are kind of a new, new there. So, so um, what else? That's about it, I guess. And lots of thanks comes, comes to you through chat, as you can see, maybe. That you are doing so wonderful work in organizing all these festivals, and uh, and you kind of deserve all the <laughs> all the great things you are getting from them. Now it's time I will uh, to unfortunately kind of end this part of the panel. This panel, analog festivals panel. I'm more than happy that you all came here. Thank you so much. We had this wonderful festival presenta presentations here. I mean, uh, from Analog Now, we had Th Thomas Tanka and we had from Experimental Photo Festival, Laura Ligari and Pablo Jori. Pablo was talking here. And then from Revalate, we had Juan Luis Ronco and then Rotlicht Festival, we had Dino Rekanovic and Kati Bruder. And I'm I'm Katri Lassila from Helsinki Darkroom Festival, and I was hosting this Analog Festivals panel. And I will thank you heart warm, warm heartedly, <laughs> all of you uh, panelists who agreed to come along and talk about your experiences here and share, share which is so important to hear what you all have you all have been doing and so interesting and i will i also thank the the members of the audience here who were who came in great numbers i don't even know how many people there were um so wonderful to have you all here also in the audience now we are so um thank you from my part um now we are having a small break, a break of 15 minutes, and I will put you randomly in the breakout rooms in which you may or you may, if you wish to continue talking to each other, uh, the members of the audience, as well as the, as the panelists. You don't have to, of course, you can just put your video off and your microphone off and you can just have a break and we will continue uh, in 15 minutes, basically. But if you wish to discuss some something or share some experiments, uh, experiences, I was I meant, then you are able to do it in these uh, smaller breakout rooms. But as you are so many present at the moment, I will um, I will put you in there randomly and not start kind of dividing you there. So, um, but see you soon. In um, well not in even 50 minutes, we start Helsinki, Helsinki time 5.45. So, so let's all meet then here. I will do how oh, many breakout rooms I need. So now I have 10 breakout rooms coming up and um, you're welcome to join if you wish. See you five. Um, 45. So thank you, panelists. Again, see you. Are you? I, I hope that you are staying until the until the next panel. All things analog. Also, you can also say 
com comment after that. There are also questions and answers, of course, if you have something to ask from um, from from the all things analog panelists. So you might have some shared things. Right, and now we are back. Uh, the breakout rooms are closing, at, uh, and and there was some interesting conversation in in some of those, and and uh, people were taking break and uh, and getting a bit rest before we continue with our second panel, <clears throat> because this wasn't yet here. Uh, this wasn't this. This there is more coming, and um, I'm really more than happy to welcome you in the next panel called All Things Analog, which involves um, representatives from four different darkroom organizations, analog or, or not necessarily darkroom organizations, but analog based organizations or analog or organizations which are involved and focused on analog photography. So we have here, um, let me see if all of them are already present here. So I'm not kind of going ahead of myself. I'm hoping that people are not in the smaller rooms anymore. No, it seems like you are all here. So I have here uh, from Analog Forever magazine, uh, Michael Kirchhoff. Kershoff. Right, Kershoff. Thanks. <laughs> Please, you're welcome <laughs> to correct me when I'm, <laughs> I'm telling your names wrong. So, and then we have from Cyan, Suan Darkroom um, Association uh, from Norway, Stig Marlon Weston. And then we have from Kalamari Club, uh, Nicholas Reinhardt. And then we have Street Level Photo Works. Uh, we have Tiu Makkonen and Isolt Zimmermans. And so you're warmly welcome, all of you. Wonderful to have you here and thank you for coming. Uh, now we'll go with uh, more or less the same concept as, as the last in the, in the previous panel. So I would love you to kind of present yourself briefly and tell a little bit about your organization. Um, would you like to start, Michael? Certainly. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, having me, and thank you to all of the uh, all of the participants, everybody who's gotten up to, uh, especially in the U.S. If anybody's from on the West Coast, you got up extra early this morning to join us. So uh, thank you, appreciate it. Um, I am Michael Kirchhoff, the editor in chief of Analog Forever magazine. Um, we provide uh, two things to the community. One is a very robust website with book reviews, features, interviews, uh, and occasionally community event reporting um, of anything from uh, the analog photography realm. So the thing is we twice a year we print uh, Analog Forever magazine, an actual print product that um, we ship worldwide. And um, we we only print uh, at this point we're printing 750 uh, per edition, and to some that's a lot, to others it's, it's not. But it's a little bit more when when we call it a magazine, it's less of a uh, it's less of a magazine and more of a journal or a soft cover book. So uh, and we pay particular attention to reproducing the artwork as closely as possible to the original, which especially for analog work, that's kind of something that you want to see. Uh, obviously, you'll never quite the reproduce a platinum palladium print uh, in a magazine as you would uh, in real life, but we, we try to do our best. Um, and um, I should mention that the magazine was started by myself and Michael Bielan. Uh, who was our founder. It was originally his brainchild, and he wrote me in uh, to help them out immediately. And it's a um, basically an artist-run passion project. Um, we fund ourselves, and um, we try to provide 
uh, online exhibitions and submissions uh, free of charge. The only thing that costs anybody any money uh, is to buy the print magazine. Which a little expensive, especially if you have to ship it internationally, but we can't control the international charges. But uh, we, we do our best to provide um, the best quality that we possibly can to the animal community. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Wonderful to hear of the magazine or journal, what you are doing. Thank you. Um, then um, how about um, our next uh, on my list, um, Stieg from from Stuan? Would you like to present a little, tell a little bit about organi your organization? Yeah, sure. thanks um, for being invited. And um, it's um, a photo studio, basically. That was the original idea of starting Cyan Studio as a studio that would be a workspace for photographers that could be cheap and available, starting out after I left school as a photographer. Uh, but wanting to do something more and seeing that there was a need for um, places to show pictures and meet people and do more. Uh, that was more accessible maybe than a, a more established gallery. Uh, I started Cyan in 1998, so it's been around for a long time. And uh, because of that staying power and just willpower in that project, it means now there's more people who know about it. So now everything runs much more easily at home at least. Uh, that's the one good thing I could say to all the festival people, just keep <laughs> keep working and uh, you will be still at work and still doing your thing. Um, Cyan is uh, now also a darkroom um, because I started so early right out from school where I learned all about being in a darkroom. It has always had a darkroom, but um, in uh, 2020, I extended and found a new space for the darkroom. So now it's a real community darkroom. And I've just grown the darkroom slowly through the years, but now I could see that it really is a need for a darkroom for people. And the analog world has just expanded so quickly the last few years. Uh, so it's wonderful to see because I somehow feel that analog photographers are more engaged. <laughs> Uh, and more um, interested in seeing other photographers work um, in the commercial world. There's more competition and in the arts world, it's more about what is photography compared to something else. But in the analog world, it feels like there is more of a community. I really like uh, being part of that and helping it out to grow. Yeah. Um, so the studio is also used as a um, gallery. It has always been uh, opened up as a gallery space just a short weekend or a week on a regular basis to give an exhibition space to people who want to test their project or maybe want to just show it while they're working at it or if it's not ready for a big gallery but it's ready to be shown uh, and then the darkroom also has a small showroom so that people can see what the other people there are doing and interested people can come in have something to look at and talk about. And uh, it's uh, interesting to now have my office next to a darkroom that's on street level with shop front windows. How many people look through the windows and are curious and come in just to talk about what they're doing and not really necessarily discuss the pictures on the wall, but to share their own, own part in this analog world. Wonderful. And Cyan, Cyan Darkroom is situated in Oslo, Norway, right? Yes, yes. yes. It's, in, um, it's in the center of Oslo. And um, I should also say that uh, I visited uh, Helsinki last autumn mm. and um, went to see the um, Katri in the Helsinki Darkroom. Uh, I was curious to see how another darkroom worked. And it was so, uh, I was so happy to see how similar we'd organize things and <laughs> see that, okay, then that must be a good way of doing it. Uh, and after that, just meeting Katze, 
felt like, yeah, we could maybe collaborate on something. So we're now starting up an artist residency or an artist exchange between the darkrooms so that people can go from one darkroom to the other and work with other people somewhere and see how it works in a different place mm -hmm. and learn from each other's experience. So we're yeah. doing it this year, hoping that we can do it more. Yes, 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 I'm hoping too. And, and we are we are hoping to expand it also and have more more dark rooms in this dark room exchange <laughs> circle. Um, thank you, Stig. Um, then I have Kalamari Club and Nicholas Reinhardt. Would you like to um, tell us a little bit about Kalamari Club and, and where yes. you are and so on? Thank you, Kadri, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thanks for the introduction and the invitation. My name is Nicolas Reinhardt and I'm the artistic director of Calamari Club. We are a nonprofit organization like so many of you and an international artist collective for the celebration of analog photography, also like so many of you. Uh, we founded the collective in 2016 with the aim to provide a platform for artists and photographers to support each other, work collaboratively and sort of build a shared infrastructure to rely on. Our institution's home is in Heidelberg in the southwest of Germany and members of the collective live throughout the country and also Sweden and the US. Um, since our foundation six years ago, we as a collective and our projects have grown very organically, meaning that since we're not profit oriented, we're non-profit oriented. Uh, we're sort of doing project after project and seeing where we develop from there. And over the years, we've come quite a bit now that we, when looking back on it. Um, our activities include the operation of an open community darkroom. We organize and curate exhibitions. We teach workshops in our darkroom at high schools, photo festivals and other art institutions. We've published a magazine for analog photography. It's called Maybe Magazine. I got one copy here, um, partly because of the ambivalence and the uncertainty of analog photography. And in 2018, we wanted to share the possibilities of that space that we operate with more people and we initiated an artists in residence program. Um, this has been a fantastic and very, very rewarding opportunity for us as an institution because not only did it show us the huge demand for residencies in analog photography, but also how much difference a fully equipped darkroom can make for artists working within the medium. Uh, we operate a professional black and white darkroom, an on-demand color, color laboratory, and a space to work with alternative and experimental processes like cyanotype, for example. Uh, when I speak about huge demand, in the first round in our artist in residence program, we had, I think, about 42 applications from 20 countries and the second residency program, which is still going on now, we had about 170 applications, which was not what we had expected, but it just showed that how over the year, so this was 2018 versus 2021 or 20, this was pre-pandemic, um, just how much this has grown. Um, our current projects include, as I just said, the cooperative residency program with a research center at the University of Heidelberg, which is also a new thing for us. And about two months ago, we started a new gallery format called Good Morning Gallery, which showcases different artists and photographers work from around the world in the shop window in Heidelberg. Um, this is not exclusive to photography, but we'll have two photography exhibitions coming up in the next few months. And what is maybe most interesting to the people on the call right now is that we have an open call for the second issue of Maybe Magazine, which is going to be published um, this year. And the call ends on the 20th of February. It's again focused on the interaction of science, art and photography. So if you feel like this is something that you want to check out, I will send you, the, I will post the link in the chat uh, window for you to look up and study. Thanks. Thank you, Nicholas. Wonderful. Wonderful. And please, yes, post the post the link to the open call. I'm sure that there would be several interested in, in, in applying. Um, thank you, Nicholas. And then we have street level photo works. Uh, Tiu or Isolt, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about street level? Sure. Hello. Um, I'm Isolt Tumamans and I'm the 
Education and Development Coordinator. Can you hear me, actually? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Okay, uh, so Street Level PhotoWorks, we are um, an open access um, darkroom and production facility and gallery space um, in the Merchant City of Glasgow. We were established in 1989 by the Glasgow Photography Group. So set up by a group of photographers who, from quite a range of different backgrounds, um, from graduates from art school or people self-trained enthusiasts, people who would maybe relate to themselves more as photographers than artists. Um, and it was back in the in this kind of times when well, there was only analog photography for a start, um, but also photography was still kind of really seen as an, an inferior medium, very much in the art world. Um, it wasn't really seen as proper art or fine art in the same way as painting or sculpture. Um, so it was still kind of fighting that battle to establish itself. Now you'll see photography in every major gallery um across the world but uh in the 80s it wasn't really the case so the the glasgow photography group got together and they wanted to create a space specifically to dedicate to photography as an art medium um but also set up a dark room so that people had access uh to making beyond uh college or art school um and also for sharing, so not just sharing the results in terms of the exhibitions, but skill sharing. Um, so yeah, that kind of sense of being um, active in the community, uh, not just the artistic community, but all kinds of other communities as well, um, was very fundamental to the setting up of street level. We've, we've moved into uh, much better premises uh, about 12 years ago as part of a sort of major um, funded renovation project in the Trongate of the city. So we have two, I mean, medium-sized galleries really, but uh, our production facilities include black and white and color film processing, um, an eight bay black and white traditional open dish dark room, um, drying facilities, mount facilities, and also a digital suite so we work across the kind of uh i guess right across the two core pillars of production and participation so we have a whole range of activities that support um artists and graduating artists um from uh, mentoring programs residency opportunities um obviously through the exhibitions program as well we the director malcolm dixon um curates quite a lot of original shows so it, it can be new work that we jointly that we support the artists in producing um it can be work that's come out of one of the residency programs i think we there's work in the finnish museum right now that's um by frank machelhini um What's that called? Sorry. <laughs> um, impressions remain as, as part of the, the photo festival. And that came out of a residency that again uh, was between Scotland, Ireland and um, Finland. So we we get involved in international exchanges whenever we can. The f yeah, that's very much additional funding based. We, we do put a lot of work into Kind of extending the, the range of what we're able to do beyond um, the kind of core funding of the, the gallery program. The access to the dark rooms is by membership, uh, so we have but very reasonable uh, membership fee. People need to have experience in the area that they're working in. Um, if they don't, we offer courses. We're kind of having to obviously reinvent all of that in post-COVID days and how we deliver that training for people um, and that is a kind of process to you my colleague is very much involved in we um 
what else? Oh my goodness, we do so much. <laughs> I, I've been working with Street Level for, I think I started working here in 1995. So within my 27 years of working here, uh, I mean, I've seen this switch from only analog right through to in the days when we were showcasing sort of cutting edge, uh, you know, uh, digital work, which is, you know, and web-based artwork and things like that. So we do showcase the full spectrum. We're not solely focused on analog. And um, I mean, increasingly, there's some really interesting, what I would say, hybrid practices, um, practices and also production methods, which um, span both analog and digital. The role the kind of the modern technologies have in um, resurrecting some um, archival work is really fantastic from our perspective. We had a major retrospective of Oscar Marzaroli a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And by scanning the negatives and then doing digital prints, we were because not all of his negatives were, were all that good, to be honest. So using um, the kind of digital technologies, we were able to bring out details in some of his works that had never, be seen, never been seen before. So there's, there is something quite beautiful in how you can uh, use some digital technology to, uh, to reinvigorate historical collections as well is something that, that we're, really, we're really keen on because obviously photography is connected so intricately to history and social history and very specific um, bodies of work that, that document, you know, small communities in the highlands and islands of Scotland. Um, I'm probably talking a little bit too much. So, but we do a lot of work like in the community as well with working with people maybe suffering uh, a whole range of difficulties or challenges. Um, not just to access in the arts, but uh, to, to, to life in general, really. So photography, we work a lot with photography as a tool um, for social engagement um, and as, yeah, as a kind of collaborative um, aspect of creating and supporting um, storytelling from a whole, from as broad as, broader spectrum of the population as possible and at the moment so we've done long-term projects with refugees and asylum seekers coming to Glasgow and the photography is really also about a way of orient orientating in the city in a way that transcends uh, language um, but also as a way to celebrate culture mm -hmm. and diversity so we've done that and at the moment we've got quite a big um, Creative Scotland funded program happening in the community with artist residents working with people locally um, to kind of process process what's happened in the last two years through the pandemic and as part of that we had TU's post which is a facility assistant so she is the kind of bridge between our you know looking after our members here but then also connecting to the artists and the community and hopefully you know making new pathways i'll stop <laughs> thank you guys thank you thank you thank you very very interesting indeed what you're doing at the at street level photo works malcolm also visited our dark room and that's how we how we of course got with street level photo works uh, got the connection and it was really nice and then then of course also what you were saying that you, you are doing cooperation with the Pohjoinen Valokuva Keskus, the North Photo Centrum in, in Finland with the residency program. That's wonderful. Well, um, you've sent me um, questions or kind of topics you'd like to discuss and there you were so wonderful sending those that there are like there would be topics for 20 panels instead of one so <laughs> i will just have to pick and think of something of these one thing that all of you are somehow dealing with it is the is of course this you've all recognized that analog photography is now a growing thing 
and it's been in decline before because when the digital revolution or digital photography came strongly in the market it seems that everywhere the analog field was declining and then um, still in the 2010s like some of you were saying before and now it's coming back or it's kind of gotten a whole new surge or a whole new wave new wave of analog photography so uh, but but it still feels at least for me it feels a little bit like there are certain areas or aspects of analog photography which are kind of in danger to disappear because many of the old techniques or interesting and kind of rare techniques are basically mastered by so few people that if they don't teach them forward then then there is nobody to know how to do these things anymore i mean you can always read on internet but it's a difficult it's, it's at least for me it's easier to learn with somebody who really masters a te some technique or some some work as than just reading some someone's uh, kind of thoughts about it so what would you say that what kind of tools or ideas or or um, um, techniques we could use um, to uh, somehow um, ensure that these analog skills are being passed also onto these younger generations within this kind of photography field what kind of thoughts you would have or what you are doing already to ensure that kind of passing on uh, what would you say for instance if i start with nicolas from calamari what what kind of thoughts you would have i was hoping i wouldn't be the first person but i'll, gla <laughs> I'll gladly take it um that's a really good question and it's actually something that um I personally and also other members of the collective have experienced themselves. Um, since most of us are self-trained in the analog world, maybe the most that I got in school was an introduction by an older person who showed me how the things were working. And from then on, it was sort of like a the get to drug. You would see a print develop in the, in the developer bath for the first time, and then you would have to teach um, everything for yourself, learn everything for yourself. Um, I mean, the basic thing we can do is educate people and probably s spread the, the need or keep the facilities running. It's been something that I have or we have experienced in terms of the color darkroom. Uh, when we opened up the darkroom before we had the color laboratory already, it was really hard to find also at art schools in Germany, find color darkrooms because everybody was just closing it down because of the technical difficulties, the maintenance, the cost, the toxicity. So it's sort of like also this social aspect, but also the knowledge. Nowadays, there's not many people that have a fully fledged training as in technical training in terms of the color processes and development. So you would have to rely on people who would take it up again and um, do it out of passion. But then on the other hand, you have um, sort of I'm, I'm sure everybody knows the story of the impossible project people who develop it out of um, out of a passion and then it becomes a commercial aspect and it sort of becomes like a, a very a huge success in itself that nobody probably would have thought possible i think there's both sides and um what i really like about this panel situation now also is that each and every one of us can only do so little but i feel like together with the notion that the analog is not dead which is probably something that all of us have always felt, even though at the times when it was in decline, it really isn't and it's gonna stay for a lot longer than we can hope. But also maybe there will be times when we will see the analog scene in decline again. And we will, I'm, I'm pretty sure that now we would be even more prepared because as long as there's not another form of photography as in analog and digital and a newer form of technology that is going to take over everything and revolutionize everything. I don't really see that this is going to go downhill, but going back to your initial question, what can we do to preserve it? Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, um, teach, um, educate and really, really lower the accessibility. Um, I, what I really feel like, especially in academia and in photography, I have an academic background in photography analysis as well. 
But um, what I really dislike about the academ academic world is that it's such a high barrier, even for someone who is just interested to get into, because it has to have this kind of arts aspect or this sort of, um, it has to be a certain quality or a class from the first thing that we need is we need to get people into the dark rooms and into those places and laboratories and get them interested and start working with it sort of like a, the notion from you have to learn the craft before you can produce high quality art, which is obvious to many probably, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Really good comment. And yeah, I, I think I, I feel much the same that, that, that that's the important part, of course, that people get exposed to the, also to, to analog photography, like often enough to, to be able to, uh, kind of learn it and get interested in it and so on. So it's kind of mirrors a lot what I'm thinking too. Um, how about how about Stieg? What kind of thoughts you have about, about analog photography and how to preserve or kind of pass it on to next generations? Um, I... Uh... I find that the idea of specific techniques to be passed on is not so important. I seem to see that it can always be rediscovered and be found out and somebody will do it. Uh, to me, it's more a question of uh, being available, having the workspace available, seeing how dark rooms were disappearing. That was a bad thing happening. And then it has we had a yeah, new new spring with uh, more darkrooms popping up everywhere and that makes more people do it because it's available. But I find in my work that I need to make sure people think about quality. Then I do workshops or I go to school and teach and how do you do this chemical stuff in a darkroom? And everybody is excited about oh it's dusty and it's dirty and it's raw, but then to make people think about the quality as well, get past that first oh this is amazing, to it can be good as well. And when you get people into that mindset, they will figure out the rest and the different techniques and how they want to use it. Uh, I see in my dark room we have in the science dark room we have. Um, uh, people doing workshops. I ask people who work with different techniques to come and do workshops. Uh, and then as soon as there is a workshop in a technique, more people start doing that. Uh, but the thing I always come back to is discussing with whoever is working there, uh, what the image looks like and how it could be better. Mm. And that you never stop thinking about that. And if you, keep that fresh in your mind, then yeah, you'll continue doing this. Mm -hmm. If it just ends up, this was a novel technique, then, then you're done with it quickly. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Uh, thank you, Stig. How about um, street level? I saw to you what kind of ideas or thoughts you have about um, this kind of how to pass on the knowledge basically you have been doing it for long in in street level photo works it was already founded in 1989 you said right yeah so i think i can maybe jump into this as well um my, so my background is i've only been working at street level for the past five or six months so i still of course has the the memory of how it's been over the decades um, but to maybe more broadly talk about it, you know, not, not only from street levels point of view, but in general, um, I think, you know, a lot of us are artists helping other artists, but artists aren't always great technicians. And especially when you're studying photography in university, you know, you will often have access to one or if you're lucky, even more technicians who are there, literally their job is just to help you get better know how to do things right. But as soon as you leave university, you often, that disappears. So all these community dark rooms, including street level, who are operating on the basis of, well, you know, you hopefully know a little bit of something before you come in, right? 
And that is already a master threshold for some people, as, and especially the last couple of years with the students who've not had access to any dark rooms for two years and they just they just don't have the confidence. They're a bit shy, they don't really know what to do. And even, even dark room courses that last maybe six, seven weeks, that's supposed to give you the whole basics. Even the cost might be prohibitive to a, a recent graduate who's just there, at least in the UK, spent potentially thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars on a degree that didn't even, even give them an hour in the dark room. So what I would love seeing is that it doesn't just fall on the artists who are running these spaces, but that there will be some kind of just pure technical apprenticeships, for example, because, you know, you have to be a little bit geeky about analog photography. Like we are all a little bit geeky about it. We have chemistry and like light and all that crazy stuff that we just like, that makes it magical. But if there's just someone there who's, you know, whose job is to support you, and if we created these jobs in the first place, you know, I'm sure there will be a lot of young people who, even if they're not necessarily wanting to become a famous exhibiting photographic artist, they still love the process. And, you know, what, how could we maybe look into funding young people's apprenticeships to become photography technicians or darkroom technicians? And then it would also take some pressure off the artists to, you know, think more about just the contextual part of it helping projects come together, you know, curating exhibitions. And then there will be another member of the team who's the one mixing the chemistry and who knows how to change the light bulb and what to do when the person's in the dark room and they're panicking about something. And then you would just have someone who has that knowledge. And I think, you know, building these kind of jobs would really help mm -hmm. preserve the, yeah, just have someone who's really good at it. You know, like I like what Steve said about, you know, someone will always, find out about those techniques and you know half of analog photography is sitting on google trawling through some like forum from 1998 finding who who had this kind of patterson tank and like how do you do this thing so there's a lot of like this stuff that we have to find out ourselves but what if we just kind of you know put that together in a more fixed way and instead of just assuming well or we'll, we'll 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 google it or we'll find out we would yeah provide something for people that's purely technical. That's true, really true. Thank you, Tio. I've, I've, um, I always remember with big warmth my old uh, darkroom master or the darkroom technician who was working at the at the University of Art and Design when when I was studying there. Old Marku, who who was had been there from I don't know maybe. 1970s or something and he knew the dark room like his own pockets and he knew everything there and he was able to help whenever any help was needed and that's of course something that would be wonderful to have also in our our working environment in our dark rooms to to be able to offer that and i you're very right with that i think that that would also take a burden out of artists shoulders that they could kind of focus on the 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 art side and so on of course some some are good at both but then then there comes always the time question that that you are not able to divide your time for everything always so it's a, it's a really good really good comment yes um then then how about michael uh, when when we are thinking about passing knowledge of analog photography you are doing that through your magazine uh, well, uh, again, I think that uh, the Finnish Darkroom Association, um, the Helsinki Photo Festival, all of the presenters today and all of the participants, we're doing exactly that right now. Um, we're discussing the topics that are important to us. They're all analog based photography topics. and. Um, that's, I think that's what it takes to uh, propel us forward. It's an active participation, it's a collaboration, and it, uh, you know, analog photography is a very heartfelt, passionate ever. So, I mean, if you think about that, if you've ever seen somebody pick up and hold a tintype for the very time, you immediately see uh, this like wash of, it's like an epiphany. People are immediately sucked into what it is 
that this object is, what this process is. And uh, we have, for a lot of it, we have things like um, smartphone apps uh, that have kind of educated people that all of these filters and Instagram and things were, those are actual physical processes. And all of those types of things draw people in and get them curious and get them active in the community. Um, so in terms of building that community, um, for myself and everyone else at the magazine, um, that's kind of what it's about. We, we strive to show uh, art, photographic artwork from people who have been doing it for decades and people for, who've only been doing it for maybe a few months even. Um, trying to show a, well, uh, a group of people who are doing all kinds of processes, um, many of which I'm, you know, I've been doing photography since I was 17 years old. So, and now I'm like 15 years old. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, there are a lot of processes that I, you know, I learned about early on and then I kind of like faded from memory. But in recent years, I'm like, because of the magazine and people making submissions to us uh, and myself doing portfolio reviews, like I'm kind of re, I'm reminded of processes that I had kind of forgotten about. And I'm also being uh, introduced to people who kind of think outside the box and take some of those processes and do them in unique ways uh, or combine processes that had never been done before. Um, and that's what I see from the community is that kind of enthusiasm and it's very infectious. So when we do things like this discussion online, um, I think that's, people will step away from this event uh, feeling a little bit more energized and uh, are going to work on their art and share their art and bring more people to the fold. Um, and the, it's only going to grow from there. I mean, analog photography never went away entirely. Yeah, there was a huge dip, but um, uh, like what was mentioned previously, a lot of the, the, the digital uh, technology that has come about has actually helped quite a bit in the resurgence of, of analog, uh, analog work. So uh, we have them to think about, think, we have them to thank for it. And, um, and that's what we're seeing as well with the, some of the processes is this kind of hybrid projects that people are, mm -hmm. people are doing. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a purist, but I think if we kind of kept everything in that realm, um, it would be, we would kind of shrink the, uh, the community too far. Um, and then that's when you kind of start to see things disappear. So being open-minded and accepting of all of the different processes and all of the different ways that we can make work, that's, that you, you can't not grow the community uh, as long as you keep talking about it. So, um, and, and I wanted, uh, to, the, to that point, I kind of wanted to, uh, I thought it was very interesting at street level photo works. We have two people here today, one who's been there for more than 20 years and one who's been there for six months. So, I mean, that's incredible if you think about it. Where, what other kind of a community can draw people from such a wide spectrum of time together uh, to engage in, in uh, the photographic art form? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting, very good. And, and there is uh, this long history, of course, and, and it's growing all the time and uh, passing on to the next ones. And it's, it's wonderful to have this continuity here. Mm, that kind of brings us, because you mentioned here, Michael, the, the kind of the hybrid forms of analog and digital, because it's kind of a, it's of course part of this discussion. Now we are in this analog, all things analog panel, but actually we haven't decided what is actually analog. <laughs> and this is kind of a big <laughs> conversation, of course, and, uh, and not maybe, we are not maybe able to answer it fully in this some minutes, but um, I was thinking about asking a little bit what you, because this is also one question that has been on the list here and coming from you that uh, what exactly is analog photography and are we in need of trying to 
somehow do we have the same idea what we are talking about basically for instance for for us in the Helsinki Darkroom festival when we decided that okay the the main idea for the exhibition at the Finnish Museum of Photography is that the the work should be analog so then we started discussing what do we mean when we are talking about analog photography and we decided that the the line we draw there that the ready works were produced anal in analog way meaning that the the prints were not um, made with a printer but they were made with some analog process some chemical process basically um, but we didn't kind of it was okay to have um, some hybrid forms and, and for instance some digital um, uh, work there in between so so for instance there were some works or there are some works now exhibited which have been photographed from the computer screen and then made to to salt prints basically so what what would you comment on that is there a need for somehow defining analog some some kind of overall understanding of what analog photography really is or or are we okay with the idea that it's a little bit hazy and it depends a little bit of the person who's talking that what what that really means is there is there even a necessity of kind of defining it very clearly <laughs> how how about you um uh, where would i start now i try to mix you a little bit the um how about um is isolt or tiu from street level what would you comment on that um i think um it's not a straightforward answer um because i can see for a festival if you're calling yourself an analog festival then i would say this there, there is need for some clarity and definition just even for the curators to decide right well what are the, the the bookends in this how what are we going to prepare to incorporate i think for somebody working supporting learning and a facility and i feel a less need to put definitions on it i mean i think i'm i like the term hybrid because i i you know again i think i love to see people kind of using modern technology while still retaining you know the kind of chemical and analog elements as well um i mean i didn't i didn't really talk a lot but when we be pre-pandemic we ran a lot of courses you, you know from dry plate to wet plate to um digital imaging so uh yeah i, I think um i think there were there, there are purists who who really do feel the need to have things that have had some digital modern element in it absolutely kicked out of the the analog uh, fields but it's not something that i feel too uptight about right right thank you yes yes it's um it seems to kind of um raise a lot of different um, opinions this kind of this this uh, kind of is there a possibility of having for instance some some um, digital uh, work flows kind of in between analog or is there, is it just is it very pure does it have to be analog all from the beginning to the end and so on so it's an interesting interesting topic of course um, um uh, how about uh, how about um, Nicholas? What what would you comment on that? Do you have? Um, of course, I'm 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 sort of on both sides. I'm a bit with what Isil just shared because, to me personally, it's not really important to distinguish the two. And I'm also thinking about, and this might be a bit of a toxic question to this analog panel if we can eventually sort of overcome this differentiation between analog and digital and it will just be about the medium of photography or is it something worthwhile investigating um sort of like the post differences post difference world or post different post differentiated world between those two spectrums 
Uh, also an interesting question to the festivals here, because I know that you're all for festivals for analog and experimental photography. I think this would be a great question for, for you as well. Um, but in the end, also Calamari Club is a collection for the celebration of analog photography. Um, I would probably, I was quite surprised that this was your definition, um, Katri, for the Helsinki Dakron Festival, that it would, has to, it would have to be produced in an analog form because I know of a lot of different artists and people working with analog photography as in form of the medium, as in the um, as film, for example, and then the production or the editing or anything would be done digitally and maybe the production would be done digital as well um and but it's sort of like it's it's like a completely different thing then um i don't really have a straight answer to that because i can f of course there's a difference and i feel like there's a need for that difference because we've already talked about the different communities that exist in photography and art photography and analog photography and how this feels more like a sort of like a closer group we could something that has come up quite often now during this these two panels i would still argue that maybe we can overcome it at one point and i'm happy to be challenged by any of the other speakers for that conclusion <laughs> i feel like juan wants to step in with something he was smirking a bit before <laughs> <laughs> one may comment later in uh, we will gladly have questions then. He was actually raising his hand. Yeah, okay, maybe yeah. later on. Yeah. Yeah, well, we will take the questions and answers. Um, yeah, you will you will get one to, to ask the question after the, the kind of the panel itself is over. So then I'm gladly taking questions and comments. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because there was kind of for us, um, there had to be some definition, of course, like always there has, has to be some definitions when we are asking something. So then it's always nice when there is kind of, there is a clear definition of what we are seeking and what we are um, wanting. If, if there is, for instance, uh, an exhibition and that's been, um, that's been one way to, to make a a definition of, of not maybe analog photography in whole, but kind of just uh, for for one um, one exhibition, basically that that how what kind of uh, when when we are kind of having an open call or something like that. So then, what we are saying that we are seeking for so um yeah, yeah maybe yeah, just a short maybe just a short addition i i, I to totally didn't mean to criticize you uh, also no, since yeah. you called helsinki darkroom festival it would be weird if someone would produce something that was not made in a dark room it was just uh, this definition yeah. was something that i hadn't heard before and that was somehow interesting yeah 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 no no i i wasn't taking it as um no it's um yeah it's just i'm just interested in general of the the um, also your views on this because it's kind of interesting question nowadays um how about um how about then stig do you have an idea about about that uh, like analog what what do we mean with it or what do you mean it, with it in in uh, in cyan dark room yeah i have too many opinions of this i think it's uh, just for me it seems like there's many instances where you need to draw a hard line especially if you're a festival or a curator or somebody who is supposed to jury an open call on photography and on analog technique what is it it i'm perfectly happy with people doing whatever they want uh, but if it's supposed to be a show on photography then or analog photography, then it needs to be just that. Uh, I think the definition you made for the darkroom festival is really good because it's something made in a darkroom and that makes totally sense. Uh, for photography festivals, I find it more difficult with how much photography is mixed up with painting. I mean, you can make analog paintings. You can use the chemicals and make paintings that you call photography, but it's made by our hand and not by light or cameras or 
any kind of photography machinery or photography technique. Uh, if you draw on a foil and then make a cyanotype print of your drawing, it's a cyanotype print, but I'm not sure if it's photography. Mm. I, in my mind, it's not, but it can be really interesting art. I just don't know if it should be in a photo festival. Mm. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's my problem with the analog world because we tend to uh, move over to anything that is handmade is can be called analog photography, but it's maybe not photography, it's just analog art, handmade art. Uh, and I do a lot of stuff handmade myself, so I know that this is a difficult line to draw. My experience in this, uh, with the, when I have had to make a definition, is for the gallery at Cyan, where the um, the line is that um, the shows must be interesting for people interested in photography. Mm. And then it's pretty open what that means. But there should be some photography involved or it should be about photography or it should be somehow inspiring for photographers the way the artists have been thinking. Um, but then it's not necessarily a only photography gallery, it's a gallery for photographers or people interested in photography. So that's somehow how the festival or the curator need to think and define, I believe, is this photography or is it analog or is it for people interested in analog photography? Uh, showcasing different possibilities of making art and maybe not making analog photography. Mm, interesting, yeah, yeah, good, uh, good thoughts. That's true that uh, the lines are, or the borders are soft and they are kind of flowing to each other, basically, within this field of analog. Like what is photography and what is, what is analog photography altogether? It's, uh, it, can, I follow, can I follow up on a question from Nicholas on the chat? Uh, but uh, the realm of experimental photography with the cyanotype example that I think if there's no subject being made an image of through light or chemical, but it's a drawing that you're printing, even if you're using photograver as printing or cyanotype or mm -hmm. whatever it is, it mm -hmm. is, you can make a lumen print of a drawing. Yeah, it's a lumen print, but I'm not sure if it's a photograph, it's a print of your drawing. But then again, it's a darkroom print. So for a darkroom festival, great. Mm -hmm. um, good. We will uh, take uh, more questions in the soon, like actually in already two minutes. But I'd love to hear Michael's idea also, or Michael th Michael's thoughts. Like, how are you in analog um, analog forever magazine? Are you do you have some kind of definition or or kind of restrictions on what kind of uh, photographs you actually actually publish in, in analog forever um i would say well for uh, i think it's up to i think it's up to the individual to decide for themselves what photography is or what analog means um, for the magazine um, we're all about inclusion so um i think that to to discount a, a you know, uh, artwork that the final result is a digital print, yet it was made from a, a large format negative, um, and then it was scanned and printed digitally. Um, I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I think, obviously, you started in an analog way, and you used a cam an actual camera to make the photograph. Um, so for me, that's, com that's perfectly valid. Um, uh, if you're a darkroom festival, then it makes sense that you require the end result to be uh, a physical analog created print, preferably in a, in, in a dark room. Um, but I think that that, you know, if you're, if you're making cyanotypes, for example, from off of a negative, obviously that's a, certainly that's a photograph, but if you're doing photograms, that, I think it just kind of gets into semantics. And as soon as you start doing that, um, you start removing people from being included. And I, uh, to me, that's kind of 
wrong. Again, we're trying to promote uh, analog photography. So um, I would, you know, include everybody, include everybody, you know, share the love. So, uh, and certainly from a magazine or magazine's perspective, that's, you know, I think that th we have no choice but to do that um, because we want to, we want to show all of the possibilities that are out there. So um, eliminating any kind of digital component from that, I think is, uh, is, is not something that we're ever going to do. Mm. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, you have wonderful, wonderful ideas here. Uh, Nicholas is raising a hand here. You had some, did you have a follow up? Yes, I had a follow up question for Michael and I'm, I'm trying not to make myself even um, less popular here. But um, since it seems like you're all drawing very hard lines when it comes to the analog and digital world, wouldn't that require you specifically to also produce your magazine in an analog fashion? Or are you doing that? Have you considered doing that? Because I feel like that it's very easy to talk about this when we're talking about single works or images or artworks and photographic prints. But when it comes to objects, printed material like books and analog uh, magazines as well, we tend to also rely on, the, on these digital tools because it's become so much easier and it's like the industry, not even just the industry standard, it's the only practical thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. Or is it? Um, it's funny because you, you mentioned like, uh, would our magazine be printed in an analog way? And it's funny because when we started the magazine, we kind of initially quote unquote branded it as analog forever zine. And that usually kind of denotes, um, something made, you know, handmade at home in a much smaller you know, like a smaller edition or, you know, a fewer number of copies. Um, but immediately we thought that kind of, that would work against us. And in order to share as much work as possible and show it in the best light as possible, we needed to kind of up our game and produce something that was a little, you know, not fancier, but, but uh, uh, done more like a, you know, your typical magazine. Uh, so, we, you know, now we call ourselves Analog Forever Magazine, but we're honestly kind of not even a magazine. We're more, like I said in the in my introduction, is we're kind of more of a journal. So um, it was kind of our own fault that we, you know, we kind of started one way and then grew into something else. But we, again, it was it was about um, kind of educating people as to what the possibilities for analog photography are that are out there. And for us to do it the best way possible, it was to pr present it in that kind of a, you know, a format, a much fancier uh, format. And, and again, that's why we also, you know, we produce a limited number of copies um, and we refer to it as an addition because um, once we're done, once we make that printing, we will, we have no, uh, no intentions of ever doing a second printing. So um, I don't know if that really answers your question <laughs> exactly, but um, yeah. I think yeah, that, I think. Uh, you know, again, it's for us, it's, it's about education as much as it is about, uh, you know, just mm -hmm. producing something that's an analog product. Thank you, Michael. It was good. But, yeah, thank you. Um, how about Juan, you had your hand up before Juan, is it is it still um, do you want now we are opening opening the panel for questions from the audience or from the other uh, okay. panelists also <laughs> okay so i i just well this is a I, as i say this is a never ending debate but for me there are when, when you talk about analog photography the first thing that comes to my mind is the for example the, the nikon f3 it has a computer inside it takes the decision digitally of your picture. So maybe that's a digital picture. The end result is not because you're making it silver dialyzed. But the, the, if you put it in uh, aperture priority, there is a microcomputer inside, well, old style one, deciding the shutter speed of your photo. So that's not analog photography because mm -hmm. it's digital involved. So if we start talking like this, we, we ended up in the pinhole, like just that. Because if you want to make, uh, for example, album and prints, or if you want to make uh, cyanotypes, 
with, uh, with a negative, but it's a digital negative because you printed before. So is that analog? Because yeah, it's a cyanotype, but, but, but you use a negative that is printed with a printer and made with a computer. So in terms of effect, in, a, in terms, for example, of a festival, when we show our work, uh, we know that we are showing analog photographies, but you can show things in different ways. For example, this magazine is going to make with a, with a printer, his magazine is showing analog things in a medium. If we make a festival, and we cannot have uh, all frame style, all the thing, real mm -hmm. ones. We can print digital prints and show what this artist is making in analog in his house. But we don't have the original one. If you want to the, sorry, I'm a, I'm a geek in this term. So if you don't follow me in this sentence, I can explain you slowly. But it's because it's about dinosaurs. Uh, if you go to the British Museum, and you go to the dinosaur, where is, is where I spend all my time watching dinosaurs, and you say, oh, it's an archaeopteryx there. And you say underneath, it's not an archaeopteryx. This fossil is not original. The original is in the United States. This is a prop. But you're not going to say, oh, this is not dinosaurs. This is fake. No, you say, OK, <laughs> it's a prop. I'm seeing a reproduction of the original one. I'm happy. So if you go, for example, to a festival, you see an, a digital print of an artwork that was made in analog, you can just say, okay, it's a reproduction and not be a kind of hater and thinking, okay, this festival is so wrong because he's saying that it's an analog festival and he's showing me the, <laughs> I think if we want to take care of what we be more open about that and say, okay, as you, you as everyone was agreeing on this, it's, it's up to the person that is thinking about, but at the end of the day, you say, okay, maybe what you're talking about your analog process is in a part of the process you wanted to make the decisions yourself and you took something analog and introduced it into the part and if you want to consider that process fully analog because you made that decision it's more than fine because you're going to use digital negative you're going to use a computer to decide what's the exposure of your picture or you're going to just scan your negatives and make a digital print because it's the easiest way for you but at the end of the day uh, it's going to be analog because one of the sentences that say here and the, uh, at the very, very bottom only involve, involves light and something that reproduces the light as a form to be a photograph. If you go to the definition, uh, when I make workshops with the people, I like to make jokes and, and in front of Spain, so that's really easy because we have a lot of sun. Uh, when in terms of telling what's a photograph, I say, okay, can you, can you just rise your sleep a little bit? You see the difference of light, you see the sleep just writing on your arm, that's a photograph because it's light drawing on your skin. So I think the easiest way to just don't hate Nicholas anymore is say anything you want to be analog is going to be analog if you put a little bit of yourself in the process. If you, if you leave every decision to a computer, every decision to a computer, that's going to be digital because the computer may everything. But if a little bit of soul there, that's analog for me. And yeah. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. I, I love it how this heat, heats up. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. Also, our chat is kind of flooding with the comments. So, so please, you're, you're welcome to read. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, thank you for the, for the opinions. You had really nice, beautiful kind of definitions and ideas about that, that how this should or should not be or should be considered. I, um, I think it's wonderful. Wonderful, and I think also that this uh, the possibilities of analog are so endless that um, that um, that well, what Michael basically said that spread the love, and that's that's about it. So so it's great, it's great that we all have these possibilities, and and uh, actually one uh, Finnish writer just wrote a book called um, Introduction to Film Era. And in his book, he was basically uh, saying that actually the, that digital photography came along, it freed the analog photography from all the restraints. And now we are basically free to do whatever we want with analog photography, because there are no, for instance, commercial uh, kind of obligations, but we can use it very creatively and, and through our own visions and ideas. And, 
all of what we want to do with it. The kind of the world is open, the sky is the limit. So it's basically, it was a good thing for analog photography that digital came along. Um, so I thought that this was really nice and positive thought after all this struggling to preserve analog photography somehow because also in Finland it seemed to decline and, and the dark rooms were disappearing completely so so this kind of positive note on it is kind of well needed so um, that uh, are there other questions now I would love to take some questions from the audience if there are any uh, oh um, Jana is asking for me the yes i will um i will write it down in the chat um, but do we have any any questions from from the audience now if you raise your hands i will i will give you the that's true of course. yeah so basically Theo, you were saying Yes, uh, when that lovely uh, member of the audience jumped in there. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just, well, as a, as a person also who, you know, in my fine art work, I shoot on medium for white color film. And of course, I would absolutely love to, uh, you know, see print my own work, but the, just the, the you know, the cost and the access to a proper space to find that and the time and the dedication it takes to make those prints as good as what well, I could right now walk into the dark room and start working on black and white prints. And, you know, there is a big divide there between, I think, artists working in black and white or monochrome and alternative processes and color film. So even though I count myself as an artist who, you know, uses analog, I still have yet to ever, you know, manually print one of my own color images. And yeah, it's challenging for sure. But uh, hey, interesting. Also happening in the chat. I'm just gonna close that window. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I that's just something that I think we can also keep in mind. Like, we, I feel like a lot of people are really into using color film these days, especially on a kind of consumer level and buying their first new 35 mil cameras and shooting color film and getting those processed. But then there's not really then that step into well, how would you print your own color analog print? So yeah, I think for for something like your festival, Catherine, that totally makes sense. Um, you know, to really celebrate the hand handicraft of a handmade print. But then going forward, how can we make sure that artists who work with color film don't get left behind and it only ends up, you know we end up raising artists who work in monochrome or cyanotype or processes that are just a little bit more accessible to like the kind of everyday artists. Thank you. Yes, yes, indeed. We start to be kind of ending our time here and it's been a wonderful discussion with all of you. Um, I want especially thanks at first though all the panelists from Analog Festivals panel, um, Analog Now and Experimental Photo Festival and Revelate and Rotlicht. And then I'd love to thank, I want to thank also all, all of you from All Things Analog, uh, Analog Forever magazine and Cyan and uh, Kalamari Club and Street Level Photo Works. And it's been wonderful to host you here and sorry about the disturbances in the end. So, <laughs> so, so don't worry about that and we'll edit them away from this um, uh, from this recording later on so then you are able to watch this this um, panel discussions later on in the youtube's channel um, in our um, uh, at the, at the museum of photography youtube channel and we will also link them to Hels helsinki darkroom festival pages so um, Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, our panelists, and thank you so much for the for the members of the audience. And I hope that we will continue these discussions about analog photography uh, later on in different places and 
both online and on these wonderful festivals and, and organizations we've been seeing today. So from my part, thank you so much and, um, and hopefully see you all very soon, either online or, or analog way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for everyone. hosting. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers to everyone. Thank you. It was bye wonderful bye. to have you all here. Bye. Bye.